Welcome everyone. Welcome to Barcelona. It's uh, as I was saying to Masha, it's really good to see everyone making the trip uh, to join us this afternoon in this amazing location. So I'm Alex Simpson. I'm heading the strategic side of the business for being in Paris and I'll be co-hosting uh, with Masha. So again, uh, thanks uh, and welcome to everyone. And welcome also. My name is Marcia Dreesen and I am a part of the leadership team together with Alex from France and heading up Western Europe. And we are very pleased to see such a diverse group of industry leaders here in this room because travel is a very critical part of the business for us as Microsoft. And so important that we thought it was very important to bring you here together here all in this room to make sure that we share the knowledge that we have and help you in developing on the transformation that the travel business is going through. So, and it's actually also a very special moment because this is our first ever Bing EMEA travel event. So very special for us, not only important, but also very special for us. So we are very honored to have you here so to have you on this journey together with us by accepting this invitation to come all the way to Barcelona. Next to the fact that this is a very special event, we also have gathered that we want to leave you to come home, to go home with basically with two things, two things that we want to leave you with. The first thing is that no any other industry than travel is being in such a high transformation. There's so much going on in travel that to leverage the opportunities that it gives all of us and you in the travel industry, you need to have a strong partner there. The second one is actually, is that Microsoft in general, but Bing specifically, we are investing heavily in order to make sure that you can leverage those opportunities into the future for your own brand and for your own advertising agency. So welcome again in this amazing location. Well, you'll be hearing the transformation word, or should I say keyword, for, uh, on several occasions. I mean, this location is a true testament to transformation. It was uh, created in 1856. I'm not going to say it was a French one, a uh, French uh, founder. <laughs> you'll, you'll know uh, more later this afternoon. But um, again, this location has uh, hosted one of the first uh, brewery and manufacturer of beer here in, um, in Barcelona. And talking about transformation, it was transformed early 2000s in this amazing uh, location. And again, transformation and uh, big combination and partnership between craftsmanship, uh, visionaries like Jean Nouvel, the architect, um, and uh, we've had a tight agenda, so we'll make everything possible so you can have the private guided tour later this afternoon. Um, again, transformation, as, uh, as Masha said, uh, Bing and Microsoft are on this journey. We've uh, started the transformation journey, and this slide to me is what you kind of can take away in um, portrait and illustrating the transformation. Over the years, uh, Microsoft and Bing have grown significantly. As you can see, we've reached in pretty much every location we're in or doing business in double digits in terms of market share. So that's true now when we talk about transformation and partnership that we are more and more uh, partners and stronger partners with, uh, with every one of you in your location and um, where you do business. Um, there's again... Uh, significant agenda. So the, the first half will be really about giving you insights on how this um, travel industry uh, is transforming. So from different speakers, Simon Calder and Matt Vignieri from Kenshu. Then we'll deep dive into opportunities you can tap into with specific insights across EMEA with Sarah. Then we'll have uh, something more aspirational and looking into the future, that's, that will be the second half with James Murray talking about the future of search and really showcasing the innovation that Microsoft has been uh, taking part in and, uh, and investing in with Esther and Andrea. So in the second half, 
um, is very exciting because uh, you get to try the HoloLens. We will do that in the next room, here next. And uh, everybody gets their turn because we will split up in two groups. So people can try the HoloLens and another group will then get a guided tour, a private tour about around this brewery. And then after half an hour, we will switch. So everybody has the opportunity to try a HoloLens. We have two of them here in the, in the room next to us. Um, some practical things. Um, as, as from 6.30 until 7.45, there will be already the famous Bing taxis taking you from here to the hotel. If you want to go to the hotel, if you want to fresh up, or maybe you didn't even check in yet, like me, uh, then you can go to the hotel and then there's taxis from 7.45 to the restaurant where, we, ha where we're, we will be having dinner at 8. If you want to spend some time here, so you don't want to go to the hotel because you already checked in, uh, you want to play around a little bit more with the HoloLens, for example, or see more about the brewery, uh, there's also taxis going from here straight to the dinner at 7.45, so make sure you're, you're there at the entrance to, uh, to, to catch that taxi. Um, and actually, now we're going uh, to announce our first speaker because we're all here about, uh, about content. And I'm actually, uh, the first speaker actually doesn't need that much of an introduction. Uh, Simon Calder, he is a journalist and he is a senior travel editor writing, for example, for the British newspaper, The Independent. And independent he is because he's famous for paying his way, so not paving the way, but maybe also paving the way, right, Simon? But paying his way to make sure that he is not dependent on others paying for his travel so he can write a nice piece about it. Um, his editorial talent also enable, enables him to write, for example, uh, for, for The Standard, he writes for BA's in-flight magazine, his, and he's also a frequently asked speaker for the BBC, ITV News, and Sky News. And we've asked Simon to give us his perspective on the major and the minor trends, what he sees in travel, and what impact that has in this vertical. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, Simon. Hello, everybody. What a pleasure and a privilege to be here. And thank you so much to Microsoft for making it all possible. It's been lovely talking to some of you, and I look forward to speaking to uh, the rest of you before the day is out. Um, so, yes, it's a, um, uh, that was last week, actually, climbing Stromboli in uh, the Aeolian Islands. Um, very, very uh, fortunate to, um, uh, to be invited here to talk about trends in the 21st century because it means I can have another holiday in this beautiful city. And my life, I don't know about your life, is all about being on vacation. So this was um, when I was working in Malta, doing a little bit of filming, which involved quite a lot of swimming, as I recall. It got worse. I had to um, go and uh, drink some beer in the Grand Place in Brussels and try all the different uh, brews there. Not quite as good as Moritz, I must say. And then worst of all, for goodness sake, I had to um, drift around Sydney Harbour being massaged by lovely Nadine while talking nonsense to a BBC camera. In Britain, we say it's a hard life, but someone has to do it. And that's why I have come here to the uh, fantastic Moritz uh, location. Now, I'm going to talk about travel trends, but everything is to do with the way that the world is affecting things. So I'm going to take a quick sprint around the world because that is going to affect, ladies and gentlemen, all of your business. Ah, uh, right. How has 2017 been for you so far? Personally, professionally, politically, it's been quite exciting. As from lunchtime today, oh, sorry, uh, we, we've got, um, uh, of course, the... Uh, uh, exciting uh, prospect of um, whatever is going to happen in North Korea. This is the demilitarized zone. Interestingly enough, I was there recently working and um, they've already got the rail line ready to go when the, uh, the two sides of, of Korea um, merge. Um, you will have noticed, I imagine, that uh, Donald Trump was um, uh, quite... Uh, um, an interesting choice of the Americans, that's all I shall say. Um, but, uh, of course, it's the first time that a travel entrepreneur has been there. And it's also the first time that we've had a president of the United States 
criticizing one of the leading tourist draws in the United States. There we are, um, at, at exactly the same time as Illinois and Chicago in particular is having a uh, big worldwide marketing campaign. Um, he is uh, saying uh, Chicago is basically way too dangerous to go there. Um, Mexico, of course, is having an interesting time, a key tourist destination, my goodness me. And um, it just emerged today, a very serious um, uh, team of researchers say that the travel ban, this was the um, list of seven countries where you weren't allowed to fly from them direct to the United States, uh, that is going to cost the US an estimated $18 billion. Uncertain times, and of course, uncertain for... Uh, many places in, in North Africa, in the Middle East, and touristically very, very tricky. Sharm el Sheikh is still under siege, as it were. Turkey had a referendum. We know a bit about referendums in the UK, um, but Turkey had one, and by the same uh, result, uh, just over 51%, they decided that they were going to go with President Erdogan. How that plays out, we do not know. Um, sadly, of course, terrorism is ever present. But it's one of these things where I look at the numbers. I don't look at the, well, of course, I look at the headlines. Everybody does. But I look more deeply. I just look at the numbers. The events we've seen in Paris, in Brussels, in Nice, in Berlin, and in London are terrible. People focus on them. But actually, statistically, the chances that you or me or anyone here is ever going to be involved in anything to do with terrorism are incredibly low. So, luckily, people are still travelling. They're especially still travelling to this glorious city. And the good thing about Barcelona is that it really is the perfect city to have an event like this, which I'm sure is why Microsoft decided to uh, locate it here. Uh, the greatest tourist draw in Spain, which itself is the leading destination country for many nationalities, including the UK, including uh, 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 Germany. And, of course, it's just full of inspiration. This is the view. If you get a chance, um, they're doing evening tours of La Pedrera, beautiful uh, house, um, just 15 minutes walk from here. And... It's a, a lovely experience. And the great thing, from your point of view, is, of course, that that picture, which is just about to be taken, will be shared. And instantly, you have being transmitted around the world these sort of inspirational images that travel needs to keep going. Ah, and keep going it does, despite everything that the world throws at it. Let's uh, spin through some of the key sectors. And I think... The most important one, actually, in terms of changes, is aviation. And, of course, uh, that powers so much of, of travel. Um, very good choice, again, to come to Barcelona, because this is where more is happening than, uh, I think, any other city uh, in Europe in terms of uh, developments. Um, so the home of a uh, couple of leading airlines, Volotea, uh, which proves that there is still a sweet spot to be found between all the high... Uh, uh, the larger airlines. So what they are doing is we've got a really nice network of um, small to medium-sized cities across Europe, serving those, keeping good at what they are doing, and leaving the um, the, the, the big scraps to uh, larger players, such as Vueling, a uh, very important airline in um, Barcelona. That's its its HQ. Uh, it was formerly part of Click Air, and crucially, what Vueling has done for some years is allow connectivity through its hub here in Barcelona. That greatly increases the, the reach and the appeal of whaling compared with the other low-cost airlines. But look, Ryanair, who you may have heard of, um, they are just about to start their first exercise in connectivity. In other words, they are going to say, we are like Iberia, Air France, Lufthansa, British Airways, we will fly you to Rome and we will connect you there to uh, Israel, to Greece, to uh, wherever you want to go. And once that happens, it means that I'm sure EasyJet will be very uh, 
soon following, and that means for the network carriers such as British Airways, there is going to be, I think, a fairly swift erosion of lots of the European flying to the extent that you may well see that British Airways will cut back on its short-haul flying and get Vueling, part of the same group, to do lots of that for it. Um, they're also going to get level, which is this um, exciting new airline starts in June from Barcelona. My goodness me. Um, it's going to be flying to the Dominican Republic, to Buenos Aires, to Los Angeles, and to Oakland, which, as you will know, is um, two hours south of Microsoft's headquarters in uh, Seattle, and it's the second airport for San Francisco. Funnily enough, there's another airline that flies from Barcelona to Seattle, and it's, uh, sorry, to um, Oakland, and it's Norwegian. And what they will be doing is um, responding, I imagine, by launching a Barcelona to Seattle service very soon. Makes a great deal of sense. Lots of business travel, not least because, of course, all the high-tech stuff in, in Seattle. Uh, lots of high-tech going on in, uh, in Barcelona as well. Huge leisure potential, great tourist destinations, both of them lovely creative coastal cities. But the really exciting thing which is happening in aviation also involves Norwegian, but it is happening further north in Scotland and Ireland, um, which at the moment are separate countries. Scotland's part of the UK. How long that will stay, we do not know. We don't know anything at the moment because, as you know, um, Theresa May has just called a general election in the UK. <sighs> but we do know that from June, you will be able to fly from Edinburgh and from Belfast to places you have never heard of in the United States. Anybody ever flown into Stewart International Airport? N no, neither have I. Providence, Rhode Island, maybe. And, oh, yeah, gentleman there, thank you. And Hartford, Connecticut, um, which I'm told is the insurance capital of the world. You've got all these flights going, where's the market for those? Well, there isn't one yet, but there will be because what Norwegian is doing is using an aircraft that started flying way before any of you were born in 1968, the Boeing 737. And it just so happens that this very, very old aircraft is perfect now with new technology to fly right across the Atlantic, three and a half thousand miles, so five and a half thousand kilometers, and carry a full payload of people to places they didn't know they wanted to go. Um, it will, I think, be a game changer because if you can get the economics of low cost short haul and apply those to long haul, it's going to be very exciting. As is the great development in Europe's airports. It's true. Circular runways, don't laugh. The European Commission has put a lot of money into researching this. Just, just go on to being tap in endless runway. That sounded as though it, was, it got better. Thank you very much. It's your magic touch. Thank you. So the idea is that for, for London, for Paris, for Amsterdam, we will now have circular airports. It's going to be very exciting indeed. Anyway, just search on Bing and you will see endless runway to find what you need. Trains, of course, are the past of travel, but they're also the future. Or are they? Well, the best place to find out is here in Spain, which actually, despite what the French and the Germans and the Italians will say, Spain has by far the best network of high-speed trains in Europe. Uh, quite remarkable, the Ave network. You can be from Barcelona to here at Atocha Station in Madrid in two and a half hours. Marvellous. So the airlines have given up, have they? Well, no, they haven't. There is still a shuttle service between Barcelona and Madrid 22 flights a day on Vueling, on Iberia, uh, going every half hour or every hour from 6.30 in the morning till 9.30 at night. And that's partly because 
The railway is still so 19th century. You have to go and get a piece of cardboard, a piece of paper with your destination on it. You have to queue up and buy that. You have to give it to somebody. They will punch a hole in it. This is primitive compared with what the airlines allow us to do. And that is why I think the airlines are still way ahead. But if you go across the uh, Atlantic, you will find that actually things are speeding up in America. This is the new train which is going to be connecting Orlando and Miami in, uh, in Florida. They, and this is all coming from private investment. Donald Trump, of course, has said that he's going to close down effectively the entire long-distance rail network in the US. Ah, okay, let's have a look at cruising. Barcelona, key cruise port, of course. Um, so what's happening with this industry? Well, it's really, really, really strange. Um, I think, I know we've got some uh, excellent guests from the cruise companies, and they might be able to explain why. I buy the leading newspaper in the UK on Saturday, and it has 10 pages costing approximately 100,000 euros per page of advertisements for cruise companies. Um, there we are. It is ridiculous. It is a really, really 20th century, 20th century way of reaching your audience. Sure, there might be the demographic of older people, people who still, unlike all of you people, buy newspapers, but that is a huge amount of the transaction between the cruise company and the customer that is simply being lost. And furthermore, in terms of customer acquisition, it is rubbish because, frankly, um, you need to target the sort of people who are looking online rather than looking in the newspaper. Ah, skiing. That's another sector which I think has um, room for improvement. Um, if you get a chance any time in the next few winters, the great thing about Barcelona is that you can be here in Bacchiera in three hours flat. Uh, it's an astonishing um, uh, location. Best ski resort in my experience I've ever visited. Um, and I've had to check out quite a lot. It's been tough. Um, and I think that the travel industry in general, and maybe you can think about how your business might do this, is not doing enough in saying, tell you what, taking a week and going for a ski holiday is, you, you don't need to do that anymore. Just have a, a long weekend in Barcelona and a couple of days skiing. It's really nearby. There is nothing that I'm seeing which combines those two yet. Plenty of um, competition, of course, in uh, uh, my money and your money looking for um, uh, places to stay. And that's a very interesting uh, area of operations. Um, huge amounts of investment still going into uh, uh, hotels. This is the Yaz Viceroy in Abu Dhabi uh, with the Formula One racetrack just uh, running behind it. Um, and here's a new story just come in this morning about um, Airbnb. Now... This is a discussion that we can have all day, all evening. To what extent is Airbnb cannibalizing the accommodation market? To what extent is it growing the market overall? All I know is that um, there are more and more questions being asked about the Airbnb model, in particular from city planners. Here in Barcelona, a few years ago, the kind of people who were investing in hotels, a lot of them said, no point running a hotel, it's very labor intensive. Um, much, much easier to buy an apartment block um, and then just sell the whole thing on Airbnb. That transforms the human geography of, uh, of cities and the planners don't seem to like it very much. Lots more to go there. And business travel. Right. The good thing about business travellers, like you very good people, is that you are high-value customers. Therefore, the suppliers are going to be falling over themselves to deliver great service and extract as much value from you as they can, aren't they? Well, no. Before any of you were born, so this is 1990, I joined the British Airways Executive Club. They know exactly where I've been. They do. I went back. I couldn't even remember going to some of these places. And yet... When I searched online repeatedly, because I don't know about you, I do pay my own way, but I couldn't find a cheap flight out of here tonight. Uh, not for anything, 300 euros, and that was on airlines with less impressive reputations, shall we say, than, uh, than British Airways. Um, so I thought, well, I'm going to go on Avios frequent flyer points. I've been searching every single day. At no stage did um, uh, Avios 
who've known me for a very long time send a quick note saying, you're trying to get out of Barcelona, aren't you, on Tuesday night? Well, why don't we do a deal? Um, why don't we help you out? In the end, yesterday, finally, one, uh, I've managed to get my seat out. Um, and uh, it'll be interesting to see if I get overbooked, because that's quite an exciting business these days, as we know. Ha! <sighs> um, Let's look at what's happening in the future. Uh, well, who knows, bluntly, except that it's going to be an awful lot more difficult when the UK leaves the European Union to travel to and from the UK. And that has serious implications, both for the UK travel industry and also for, for outbound providers elsewhere. It's uh, going to be tricky because the European Union has already said, we want to have electronic border checks we want everybody who's coming from outside the European Union to go through the kind of online uh, palaver you have to do with, uh, uh, with the ESTA for the US. So that is going to happen. It will put the UK beyond that. That means it will make it tougher for British people to travel abroad. And on top of that, it will also mean that uh, a lot of Europeans who currently, if you've got an Italian identity card, you can go to the UK. That will stop. You will also have to register online it's going to be very, very messy. That's one certainty. Another certainty is that we will find that social media is enabling every consumer to become a possible reporter. And we know what happened with United Airlines, that terrible story. And when, within a week of poor Dr. David Dow being dragged off the plane, you have the Wall Street Journal saying, boycott United. Um, that's quite bad news for a, a huge brand, and the reputational damage is, is going to be immense, whatever they are now doing about uh, changing their policies. Um, people are going to get sick. I'm sorry to say it. Um, beautiful Miami uh, still has uh, a Zika issue. Zika is gen genuinely having quite a serious impact on a lot of travel to Florida, to Latin America, to few other parts of the world. Um, it's not going away anytime soon. And you can be fairly sure that we will get other diseases which, like Ebola, are either very small impact. Of course, I don't wish in any sense to diminish the terrible suffering in Liberia and uh, Sierra Leone and Guinea. But in terms of global health, they were very insignificant. But it still put lots of people off traveling to Africa. Um, but we are or it will be something like a global flu pandemic, which we will be, uh, will have a very serious effect. Sorry. There will also be, anybody know where this is? Napoli, perfect, yes. And uh, that, that uh, lovely mountain in the background, that seems to be Vesuvius. And um, the thing about Vesuvius is that it, it regularly erupts and it hasn't erupted for quite a long time. It's rather overdue. And you can possibly, if you were traveling, uh, 2010, remind, uh, remember where you were when um, suddenly we learned we could all say Eia Fiat Yad Yoko. Um, or if you need a pronunciation help, there is one here. Um, it was, uh, it caused hundreds of millions of euros of, of uh, uh, damage to the travel industry. Personally, I was I'm on holiday pretending to work in Norway at the time. It was, you didn't need to speak Norwegian to know that things weren't going particularly well. I flew out as a passenger on SAS and I came back as freight on a container ship. But the great thing is, travel is the most important thing that people do. It connects everybody. The more we travel, the more we understand the world, the more we transfer wealth from richer countries to poorer countries. It is the most benign and marvellous thing we can do. And that is why it is an honour to be looking into the future here in Barcelona, because I think as the amount of work diminishes, as we get hopefully a bit more spare time, uh, we will all spend much more time being tourists, getting experiences rather than getting uh, possessions and we will all be the richer for it. So, thank you very much. We have time for a few questions, if you have any. Oh.
Thank you very much indeed. Um, any questions? Oh, here we are, and here's the roving microphone. Or is it a question, or both? Um, I, in the absence of a question, I will um, just, uh, or while you're thinking of a good question, um, I'm just going to say, we got the news about the British general election very, very um, shortly, uh, just, just an hour or so ago. Uh, this is going to have another impact that we just weren't expecting. There's so much political uncertainty around at the moment. And what tends to happen, and I know that we've got representatives from, from, um, uh, from TUI, from Thomas Cook, from Jet2 here, all very good uh, companies, all with lots of inventory to sell for May and for early June. And um, unfortunately, the British, when there is a big political event going on, everybody tends to stay and watch it on television rather than going to Greece and Spain and Portugal and Italy and Florida and Cuba and everywhere else. So yet more work to be done selling those holidays. Uh, question. Um, I'd love you to just uh, maybe expand a little bit on the um, circular runways, bearing in mind that in the UK, we've been trying to get a third runway at Heathrow forever, and we can't make a straight runway. How realistic do you think it is that everyone's going to com completely switch to this new circular runway? So this circular runway, um, I'll, um, I'll, I'll see if I can spin back and, and get the... Uh, um, oh, crikey, this is rewinding through history very, very quickly. Um, it's going to be quite... Uh, uh, qu I, I spent a long time talking to the guy who designed it. Um, and the idea is, you can just about see it here, so one aircraft is coming down there while another one is just turning off. You've got no problems with the wind direction because wherever the wind is coming from, you can always um, fly into it because it's circular. Pilots have quite an exciting time. Um, I don't know if we've got any pilots here. Uh, from what I understand, landing is the trickiest part, and that's when you're going straight. Uh, if, you're going st if you're landing and then immediately having to um, corner like a Formula One driver, I think it's going to be really, really exciting. But the European Union has put millions into this. They are very serious, and there is going to be a, a, um, a model created using cargo drones quite soon. Um, and then if that works, they are going to uh, start doing things with designing a new uh, airport somewhere. But they're going to need quite a lot of space. It can't be a very busy airport initially because they're not really sure how it will work. But they say Europe will run out of space by 2050. And if we don't have circular runways, we're all doomed. But they've been saying we're all doomed for quite a long time. And um, so far, we're still here, I think. We've got time for one more quick question, if there is one. Okay, well, look, uh, I think since we're now exactly on time, um, I will thank you so much. I'm looking forward, as I say, to talking to as many of you as possible. I really appreciate all your time. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. It's all right, we'll get there. Um, thanks for this uh, inspiring and thought-provoking um, intervention, Simon. Let me now introduce you to Matt Vigneri. Um, now we've kind of, with Simon, discovering um, how travel is transforming. Um, I'm glad to have Matt coming on stage to discuss about how the marketing of travel is transforming and evolving as well. Uh, Matt is Managing Director MEA of uh, Kenshu, a leading provider of online marketing services. Uh, and he will be sharing his uh, thoughts, vision, insights, best practices on this transformation for the marketing of travel industry. Welcome on stage, Matt. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so this presentation doesn't contain any viruses anything circular, um, or, uh, but it's, it's quite inspiring and hard to follow somebody like Simon. So again, I'm, I'm Matt Vigneri, I'm based in London. Uh, you probably recognize the accent. 
Uh, <laughs> I've been in London for the last three months. I moved to, from San Francisco, uh, where that last picture was taken, um, quite a long time ago, uh, as the, to run Europe for Kenshu. And Kenshu is a, a, a as, as uh, Alex had mentioned, a marketing platform that enables marketers such as yourselves to uh, take advantage of the opportunities in both the search and social platforms. And so, um, and basically, I just want to share a couple of thoughts and, and, and ideas and things that we're seeing. And this is all based on Kenshu data. Uh, travel is our largest vertical, followed by retail. Uh, but I think you, you all know this, right? You've seen the increase in, in year over year trends. In 2000, from 2015 to 2016, we've seen search uh, spend go up with volume following very, uh, uh, behind it with clicks. But on uh, the side of social, we've seen uh, actual spend stay fair, fairly uh, limited, but volume go up. And there's a reason for that, and I'll share some of that with you. But what we're seeing in the marketplace is actually a challenge or perhaps an opportunity because the competitive market for travelers is increasing. Um, you know, you know who those competitors are. I think Simon mentioned some of them, right? Airbnb's in the business. Um, you know, we're at a big event, so I can say, you know, Google wants to be your travel agency. Um, everyone's fighting for that dollar. And millennials, as I heard someone during the networking, we were talking a bit about millennials and what's going on with them, are trying to decide where do they spend their travel dollar and how do they do it. And so with competition increasing and disruptive new models coming into play, uh, we at Kenshu have found a few things that we'd like to focus in on. And one is, is actually taking and delivering excellent customer service. We think that's the biggest differentiator that a travel partner can make today. Um, and you do that really the way we see it in three ways, right? One is through diversification, the other is through focus, and then finally through scale. And diversification and scale are what actually deliver the volumes you need to do this, but it's focus on the customer experience because defining that experience is actually where we see travel, online travel, making a difference. Um, so let me share a little bit about diversification. Uh, we have a little feature in our product called campaign, campaign mirroring. And with campaign mirroring, basically it's a very low effort, low, in, low, low um, investment of time on your part. And so we've diversified by going into another channel. For example, we've seen a lot of our clients who are spending a tremendous amount on search, particularly on Google, and we thought, well, what if we took the advantage of the investment on the Bing network? And so uh, what I'm going to show you is actually the year-over-year -year change and then the ROI that we saw simply just by mirroring effective campaigns on one channel, Google, onto another Bing. And so what you can see is actually 47% growth in year-over-year, -year, but at $12.85 uh, $12 in increased ROI. And so for impact, I'll put that up there again. Um, and so as you start to diversify your channels, what, what we're attempting to bring to you is actually the opportunity to look at other publishing channels. Now we talked a little bit about um, uh, the, uh, the innovation of customer experience and what we believe is actually that you can, you can take intent and engage with intent onto other channels. And so looking at the uh, potential that you have in taking all of that search information and driving it into other channels, you know, such as Bing, for example, or Facebook or Instagram, we've seen tremendous growth in the marketplace. And so let me share with you what one of our publishers saw, but the data pretty much speaks for itself, where we've seen cost of sales go down, ROI increase, simply by taking the intent that they built on search and driving it towards other channels and creating that experience that tracks you along what you want to accomplish in travel. And so that's really all we wanted to share today with you. Um, but thank you for having us. Thank you, Bing. And uh, we look forward to, to sharing some more innovations with you uh, as the day goes on. Thank you, Matt. And maybe there are some questions because those are some impressive set of data. Are there any questions for Matt? Pretty quiet audience. There, on the back. Let, let, me, let me go to you. Okay. Hi. Um, 
how do you foresee the change from the expanding voice search, especially on Bing? Uh, thank you. That was actually one of the, the points. Um, you know, voice is providing an interesting signal. Um, and so one of the things that, if, if we went a, a level deeper on how some of this data is derived, there are actually in, um, quite a few signals that, that, um, that we, we cover as we look through the changing uh, attribution models, if you will. And so signals on mobile devices such as pinches, swipes, and how fast you swipe and how fast you pinch or, or whether you spend some time on that mobile page are all signals that we're starting to gather. Voice is a whole nother um, uh, opportunity, if you will. Um, the, the, what we're starting to see is, is actually uh, voice becoming the leading, leading search, right? No one's gonna go to a mobile browser and type in, they're just gonna say, you know, hey Cortona, you know, I'd like to go to Barcelona this weekend. What's interesting about that is the transformation is, is that there's only gonna be one position in the ad. And that'll be the response that the voice activation, the voice personal assistant gives. So, so what we see changing is actually competing. The, 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 I, I don't know what the costs are going to be for someone to do a voice search and get that single position, but you can bet that Amazon, for example, and Alexa want to make sure that they give you the first, very first most profitable product on there. And so uh, the same is going to go for all other voice assistants, in, in, in my opinion. Yeah. Does Thank it you. answer your question? Good. Yeah. And it's a good thing that Amazon, but also, of course, iOS are partners of Bing. So yes. our algorithm can learn every day. Are there any more questions for Matt? Well, thank you very much, then, Matt. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So in talking about insights, uh, we have a next speaker for you, and it's a she. And she actually knows a lot about Travel Insights. I'm uh, talking about Sarah Essa, and she's our Travel Insights Manager uh, based in the UK uh, with a lot of knowledge in this industry. And uh, as you can see on the next slide, which I will show you here, she loves playing around and spending time in the search logs of your customers, either to understand their intent, but also to understand what her next travel destination will be because she loves traveling also very much. Without further ado, welcoming on stage, Sarah Essa. Hello everyone. All right, I'm just making sure I can get this head, this microphone to not be too squeaky. Um, it's a delight to be with you all today, and I'm going to be talking to you about Travel Insights. So, my presentation today is called Through the Looking Glass. Now, some of you will recognize that this is actually a tribute to Alice in Wonderland, and I've chosen this theme specifically because we're going to embark on a bit of an adventure today. I'm going to take you through the looking glass, behind the screen of a mobile PC or tablet, and into the world of online travel consumers on Bing. But before we do that, let me just say a few words on insights management at Bing and our mission, which is best epitomized by this quote, a moment's insight is sometimes worth a life's experience. Here at Bing, many of us used to be in your shoes. We used to be agency side, client side, and so we appreciate how frantic campaign management can be, how you probably have data pouring out of your hair, ears, eyes, feet, everywhere. And sometimes taking that moment to make sense of all this information, to really see the wider audience, vertical, marketplace picture, that can slip to the bottom of your list. And this is where insights management comes into the frame. We want to be that helping hand of insight to our advertisers. We want to provide you with cutting edge research to give you that moment's insight that is truly invaluable to the success of your campaigns. 
And just so you know, we're actually a really generous crowd here at Bing because today, I'm not just gonna give you a moment's insight, I'm actually gonna give you 40 whole minutes of insights. <laughs> so be prepared. Okay, so what will we be exploring today? So, I, the objective of today is to really enrich your understanding of online travel consumers on the Bing network. What I want to do is I want to confirm those nagging suspicions you've always had. I want to challenge those preconceptions that, you've been, that you have as well, and hopefully teach you something new about online travel consumers that you didn't know on the Bing network. In order to do that, we're going to explore three chapters today. We're going to look at search user journey, search audience behavior, and also search destination trends. So, without further ado, let's start off with search user journey. Search user journey is this really hot buzzword in travel right now, so many of our travel advertisers are keen to know more about search user journey. So we've listened to you, and we've been pioneering innovative research on our end to get under the skin of the consumer decision journey. What we have did is we took a sample of about 1,000 users who made searches on the top generic flights, hotels, and car hire searches on the Bing network, and then we monitored that, their internet activity over the course of two months, over January and February 2017. And from all that information that we gathered, we were able to map out a consumer decision journey for flights, hotels, and car hire. As this analysis is brand new, it's the first of its kind, the test run of this study was done for the UK market, and I'll be showcasing the findings of that today. It is our ambition, however, to roll out this analysis to other EMEA markets in the future, and so we'd be really keen on getting any feedback we can about the, um, the views that you'll be seeing today. So, to kick off, Let's start with the consumer decision journey for flights. Our first finding relates to the length of a consumer decision journey for flights. We found that the average length was 20 days. However, some of you will also notice that there is a notable proportion of users who booked on the same day. So if you look at the largest um, bar on the graph, you can see that there's a notable proportion of users that booked on the same day. Now, this might surprise some of you because we often work on this assumption that when you book high-value items, you, tend, you take your time with that purchase. But actually, our study is showing evidence of quick decision-making when it comes to flights, even though it is a high-value item. If we now turn our attention to the number of searches in a consumer decision journey for flights. The average for, in terms of number of searches for flights was three. Now, you might be wondering at this point, what does three mean? Is that high? Is that low? What's the context here? So let's throw in some comparison. We found that the average number of searches in a consumer decision journey for hotels was 11. We found the average number of searches for a consumer decision journey for car hire was eight. So actually flights has, a very, has the lowest average when it comes to number of searches in a consumer decision journey. Now why could that be? Well, the story we're seeing that is emerging is one that suggests that the consumer decision journey for flights is not as overly complicated as we might imagine. We are seeing evidence of quick decision making and simple decision making. Even though it is a high value item, it doesn't necessarily conform to the assumptions we would have when it comes to high value items. If we now turn our attention to the most popular domains visited by our sample of 1,000 users, we can see that Skyscanner is the dominant domain for the UK. However, there is a lot of user overlap between the domains, between the OTAs in particular. Given that there was only 1,000 users, and if you look at the distribution of users by domain, there's quite a lot of overlap that is occurring. We're now going to deep dive into the stages of a consumer decision journey. But before we do that, let's define 
the stages. So we believe that there are five stages in a consumer decision journey. They start with stage zero, which is the first search, stage one, which is the beginning of research, stage two, upper funnel consideration, stage three, lower funnel inquisition, and stage four, which is the conversion itself. With this in mind, let's turn our attention to queries and the types of queries that occur at different stages of the consumer decision journey. Now, queries are really important because they're pathways to consumers. And with consumer decision journey, you can see the role and the value of different types of queries at different stages. So what we found when we analyzed the top queries for the consumer decision journey for flights is that location queries become more dominant in the later stages of the consumer decision journey. You can see that it starts off at 23% in stage zero, and it increases to 40% in stage four, which is quite a substantial increase. And to further sort of visualize this, we actually have some of the top queries at each of the different stages for the consumer decision journey for flights. And the queries highlighted in green are the location queries. And you can see that they become a lot more prominent in the later stages of the consumer decision journey. Moving on to the consumer decision journey for hotels. And to reiterate, this is also based on the same methodology. We used 1,000 users who made searches on the top generic hotel queries and monitored their internet activity over the course of January and February 2017. So our first finding relates to the length of the consumer decision journey. The average length for hotels was 26 days. Now again, you might be wondering, what does 26 days mean? Is that long, short? Well, let's add some comparison into the mix here. We found that the length of a consumer decision journey on average for flights was 20 days. The average length of a consumer decision journey for car hire was 12 days. So hotels on average, have a longer length when it comes to consumer decision journey. And why might that be? Well, our research suggests that the reason for this is because hotels are a complex product. That actually, there are many variables that people consider when booking a hotel. Not just the location, it could be to do with the facilities of the hotel, the amenities within the room, proximity to points of interest, these are just some examples of the variables that people take into account when booking a hotel, which is why we believe um, they take longer to book a hotel than they would when booking a flight or car rental services. If we look at the average number of searches in a consumer decision journey for hotels, the average we found was 11 searches. Now again, let's contextualize this number. What does 11 mean? Well, the average number of searches in a consumer decision journey for flights was three. The average number of searches in a consumer decision journey for car hire was eight. So hotels have the highest average number of searches in a consumer decision journey when compared to other sub-verticals. And again, this just supports this story we're developing here about the complexity of hotels as a product. There are so many variables to consider, which is why consumers take longer in terms of days and also require more searches before they convert. If we turn our attention now to popular domains, we can see that booking.com is the dominant domain for hotels. But again, if you look at the distribution by number of users, you can see that there is a lot of user overlap between the OTAs and between the domains as a whole. We also see some unexpected popular domains. You can see EasyJet and British Airways in the mix, which might surprise you because, in fact, EasyJet and British Airways do offer holiday services. You can book hotels and flights on EasyJet and British Airways. And that may, not, that may be news to you, but it seems that our, con our consumers and our users are aware of this, and it is amongst the po most popular domains in our study. If we now look at the types of queries um, that are occurring at each stage, we can see that generic plus location queries 
are very dominant in the early stages of the journey, but they shrivel as we progress towards the end of the journey. So they go from around 30% in stage zero to just 7% in stage four. And stage four is very much dominated by brand hotel name queries, which account for about 70% of the top queries that are occurring in stage four, which again is just that illustration of the complexity of hotels as a product. People start off with generic searches to explore the variables and the options, and by the end of the journey, they have really narrowed it down to a specific hotel that meets all the criteria. And of course, you can see a visualization now of these top queries by stage. And you can see in green the prominence of branded queries towards the later stages of the consumer decision journey. You also see queries becoming long, more long tail towards as you progress towards the end of the journey. You can see that in stage four, you have queries like Bentley Hotel New York promotional code, which are branded but also long tail. And that's, hap and that's just that specificity kicking in in stage four as people know what they want to book. And now for the, finally, the last consumer decision journey, which is for car hire. So the, in terms of journey length, the average, uh, the average for the consu consumer decision journey length for car hire was 12 days. However, we see a significant proportion of users also booking on the same day. So around 22% of users in our study booked on the same day, which would confirm those nagging suspicions you probably already, that you all, most of you have, that car hire is a last minute purchase. It's something you do closer to the holiday rather than book months and months in advance. If we look at the average number of searches, the average for car hire is eight, which suggests that there is some consideration involved when booking car hire. In terms of its average compared to flights and, ho um, and hotels, eight searches is mid-range. So there is a degree of consideration involved in the consumer decision journey for car hire. And then if we look at popular domains, we can see that rental cars is the, is the dominant domain for car hire. And actually, unlike the previous, unlike flights and hotels, rental cars really is a leader in this space because there isn't a great deal of overlap between the other domains, so as there was in the case of flights and hotels, which would suggest that actually when it comes to flights and hotels, consumers are more likely to search and compare, try and get the best deal possible, but with, um, but with the field of car hire, there is some brand loyalty at play here which has resulted in the concentration of users going to rental cars. And finally, when it comes to the types of queries at the different stages, we see that generic plus location and generic plus airport queries dominate in the early stages of the journey, but that all starts to filter away as we progress towards the end of the consumer decision journey, and we see brand plus location queries and branded queries really taking the lead. In particular, you can see that brand plus location has a very minimal presence in stage zero, but it progresses to around 40% in stage four. And if we look at the actual queries themselves, you can see the queries in green are the branded queries that become a lot more prominent in the final stages of the consumer decision journey. Now, moving on to our second chapter today, which is to do with search audience behaviors. When it comes to search audience behaviors, we wanted to tackle another buzzword in the travel industry, which has been mentioned actually just a few moments ago, which is to do with digital assistance. So, before we get into that, let's start off with a brief overview of the digital assistance landscape at the moment. So before you, you have the four key digital assistants in the market. And in terms of digital assistants, they sort of fall into two categories. You have digital assistants that live on your phone, on your PC or your mobile, like Cortana, or you have digital assistants that are devices in themselves, like Amazon Echo. Now, some of you may know this or may not know this, but out of the four digital assistants that are on screen, Bing Search actually powers three of them. We power Alexa, Siri and also Cortana, of course, which is Microsoft owned. 
So the question we, well, the question that we received just a few moments ago that we've been receiving from many of you is, what is the imprint of digital assistance in travel? You clearly, Bing is clearly present in this space, but what is happening in the travel vertical when it comes to digital assistance? So we tried, we investigated this specifically to try and answer that question. So what we did is we looked at the UK, Germany, France and Italy, some of our key markets in Europe, and we tried and we saw, we tried to figure out the contribution of Cortana digital assistance to overall travel search volume. Now, it's not going to come as a surprise that when it comes that digital assistance is responsible for less than 10% of overall travel search volume in these markets. It's, it's no surprise because digital assistance is in its infancy and we don't expect it to be contributing to the majority of travel search volume that comes through. What we were looking for, however, was signs of growth. We were trying to get a sense of, is digital assistance growing in these markets? And if it is growing, what's, what does that growth rate look like? And this is what we found. We can see that search volume from Cortana digital assistance in the travel vertical is growing across all these markets. The growth rate varies depending on the market and also depending on the travel vertical that you're looking at. But there's overall a really positive story here of year-on-year -year growth when it comes to volume of, that is coming through from digital assistance. And that is a really promising sign of a greater role that digital assistance can play in the future. There is also a device story here at play when it comes to digital assistance. If we look at this example of Cortana-assisted flight searches, if we take the year-on-year -year growth for Cortana-assisted flight searches and slice it by device, we can see that the year-on-year -year growth is mobile-driven. So there is clearly a device preference when it comes to digital assistance. If we look at Cortana-assisted hotel searches, the same story emerges. If you slice that year-on-year -year growth, it's mobile-driven. And if we do the same for car hire, Cortana-assisted car hire searches, you slice that year-on-year -year growth and it is also mobile driven. So there's clearly a strong device preference for digital assistance that is true across all the key travel sub-verticals in these markets. And lastly, what about the types of queries that are coming through digital assistance, that are coming through Cortana in travel? Well, when it comes to the brand generic mix, we were able to see that the top queries in terms of volume that were coming through Cortana in travel in these markets were brand driven. And so there's clearly that it's an illustration that consumers who are using digital assistance have specificity in mind when they use digital assistance. And what about the future of digital assistance? Well, the future is looking very bright. It's forecast that there will be 4 billion mobile OS based assistance in use by 2021 globally. And what does that mean for advertisers such as yourselves? Well, it's also forecast that advertising spend will increase by 104% by 2021 with regards to digital assistance. At the moment, digital assistance isn't, as, isn't monetized in many places, but that is certainly something we can expect to see in the future. And finally, our last chapter for today, search destination trends. So, over the last year, we have been listening to all of you to get a sense of what destination insights you are after that would be impactful to you, to help you understand what destinations are top, in, are top of mind for online consumers. And as some of you may be aware, we actually produce a monthly trending travel destinations report. We've recently, well, over the course of the last year, really, we've improved that report. We've added many new features to it. And I really wanted to take this opportunity to talk about those new features and their use cases as well. And of course, if you aren't aware of the Trending Travel Destinations Report, it's, it's produced monthly and it's available through your account team. So please feel free to do so um, and explore this report as well afterwards. So firstly, when it comes to the trending, um, when it comes to destination trends, 
One thing, one key thing that you can do with our trending destinations report is recognize change in consumer taste. So to illustrate this, I'm just going to use the example of France as a case study. So it is no surprise, I'm sure, to you that, that there has been a decline in French tourism. And if we look at third party data, we can see that France lost over a billion euros in tourism sales last year. Foreign visitors to the country are down by 7%. Paris was hit particularly hard. This decline that is happening in French tourism is also very visible on the Bing network too. So if we look at UK volume year on year for flights to French destinations, we can see an interesting pattern emerging. So we can see that in June and July, volume, UK volume for flights to French destinations was actually up year on year. But following a string of terrorist attacks in July, you see a really sharp incline, a decline, I should say, happening in August. And actually, that year-on-year -year volume decline continues from August, and it hasn't really recovered since. Even in January, which is when we see the most travel search volume on Bing, you don't really see a significant uplift for people searching to fly to France from, um, who are based in the UK. So this is just an illustration of how reactive consumer, um, consumers can be to current affairs. And our report allows you to, to see that reactivity, but also to quantify the loss too. Because it's easy to predict that when something, when, when something terrible happens, people may not wish to travel to that location. But what's harder to predict is to really quantify that loss. And with our report, you can do that. The next thing, the other feature of the trending destinations report is to do with, actu with top trending destinations based on year-on-year -year growth. I should add that we, you can see trending destinations for multiple sub-verticals in our report. We have the example of flights above, but you can see trending destinations for holidays, for car hire, for hotels, for cruises, and for a number of markets. So we have this data available for all EMEA markets and also North American markets as well. But in the example, of course, I've just selected a few EMEA markets and used flights as a vertical. But this is really useful too, because it helps, because in, in the absence, when, other, when certain destinations decline in terms of search volume, the question naturally arises, well, where are people traveling to instead? And when, with trending destinations, you can see the, those destinations that are rising in terms of year-on-year -year growth that perhaps you may not be able to see in your campaigns, but you, with our report, you can actually see what is happening on our network. Lastly, we, well, not lastly, two other slides, I forget, but you also, we also provide information on points of interest. And again, this is available for all the MIA markets and North America markets. And this is really interesting too, because actually, when it comes to points of interest, that can be very influential when people decide on hotels or car rental services or other, or even if you have a business that sells tickets to points of interest, this could be very insightful to know the rising points of interest in terms of year on year growth. And again, it's one of those things where you may not be able to see this trend in your campaigns, but through our report, you can see what's happening on our network as a whole. And finally, we also provide you with top volume queries um, for all the MIA markets and North American markets, for many sub-verticals that I previously mentioned. And this is really useful as well because it means that you're capturing these top volume queries in your campaigns, not missing out on traffic for those key products that you sell. So, now we've reached the end of our journey through the looking glass. And what did we find? Well. I'd like to take you to the beginning here, really, in terms of what we set out to do today. So I wanted to confirm those nagging suspicions you've always had, challenge your preconceptions, and also teach you something new about online travel consumers on the Bing Network. I believe that we've covered all three grounds over the course of the three chapters that I took you through today. So if we start with search user journey, we discovered that actually, audiences behave very differently within travel. If you look at the example of flights and hotels, both are high value items, but the audience behavior is very different 
So if you have a business where you sell all of these products or some of these products, optimize those campaigns to the audience for them. If we turn to search audience behaviors, we've confirmed that nagging suspicion, that rumor that digital assistance is growing. It is growing. And, but we further unmasked that growth. We were able to attribute it to being mobile driven and we were able to see that a lot of it is brand driven too. So while we, while presently digital assistance is not a leading contributor to travel search volume, we do expect it to have a greater role in the future and that you should be prepared for that with brand first mobile strategies to really take advantage of digital assistance. And lastly, we looked at search destination trends. We highlighted the new features, the use cases behind those features and how you can really use those features to get closer to those destinations and points of interest that are at the top of the mind for online travel consumers. Oh, and there we have it. So that is, um, thank you all very much for, for listening and I'm, I don't know if we have time for questions, but if we do, I'd be more than happy to take them. We have a few moments, so if you want to ask any particular questions to Sarah, <laughs> feel free to. Simon? Sorry, everybody. Um, that was fantastic, Sarah. What an amazing amount of research and very well delivered. Thank you. One thing which really surprised me, and I don't know how many of us will have done the same when booking a leisure trip as opposed to a business trip, 22 days between deciding I'm going to go and booking the flight. That strikes me as incredibly long, not least because airlines tend to say, we've got two seats left at this price and then the price is going to go up. So I'm interested in perhaps if there's somebody from an airline who wants to respond about why that takes so long. Um, you, know, you, you snooze, you lose, I think is the, uh, the phrase that the um, airlines might use. And I don't know what your response is. Were you surprised by that length of time? So I believe it was the average was 20 days. And yes, I would concede that I was surprised too, because personally, I'm one of those people that takes weeks and weeks to make my own decision when it comes to airlines. So I was, it, it, it did strike me as a low number that it was just 20 days. But it seemed, but I can see why when you think about it, it uh, the flight product itself is not highly complex. It really just relies upon a location. And given how sophisticated comparison sites are nowadays, you can get the information you need pretty quickly. So I can see how with the comparison sites and the lack of complexity of the flight's product, that might result in people being quicker when making decisions to do with flights. Oh, sorry, to, it's me again. Um, that's really interesting, because you thought that 20 days was low. I thought it was high. Oh, Should I Should we see. take a vote? <laughs> Who takes less than 20 days to, uh, to, to make a decision? Oh, okay, I'd say slightly more. Who takes more than 20 days? Ooh, okay. <laughs> so, well, maybe it's just because we're lucky enough to work in this industry, or in my case, pretend to work in this industry. Um, it's, uh, yeah, fascinating. Anyway, thank you very much. Another question for Sarah? Oh. Hiya. Um, I had a question around the voice searches. Um, at what point, because voice searches are inherently quite a long, um, long tail terms, you have lots of, um, you know, words in there. Um, at what point will you sh start showing ads against those? And at what point should kind of, advertisers be actually building out campaigns to support those? Is it just a case of waiting to see the searches come through, you know, through broad matches and things, or, or should we be doing these things, you know, ahead of time? So, I don't have a precise timeline for when um, digital assistance will be fully monetized, but with regards to the, I, the question on long tail searches, I mean, long tail searches are not just happening on digital assistance. We saw earlier on that they were happening in, like, um, in well, gen generally in search as well with certain sub verticals. They tend to be more prominent. So, as we saw with hotels, you see long tail searches towards the end of the consumer decision journey. So, I would say that it is worth investing if you are keen on capturing long tail, and if we see evidence of long tail being 
towards the end of the decision journey that people do convert on long tail, the best way to capture it currently would be through investing in broad match, um, making sure that you are present when people are searching for those long tail queries and are about to convert on them. Firstly, uh, kind of fantastic presentation, thanks for that. Um, I think it was quite interesting that in the kind of different stages, you never really kind of call out differences between mobile and desktop. Is that kind of a conscious decision because you're kind of treating it more as a consumer or is kind of how would you expect the behaviors to differ, differ mobile versus desktop through that? So I would say that, I mean, generally speaking with travel, the, it, is, it is a PC dominant vertical. So I, in terms of like practical optimizations with your keyword strategies and your bids and things like that, I would, I would kind of, I would assume that the, like the decision journey analysis that you've seen is like it's led by PC in that regard. And so the, the findings that we, that we have come across with the consumer decision journey analysis would apply to the majority of, of, of your campaigns and what is really, and would have and the sort of, those findings would be the most actionable when it comes to actually optimizing for conversions because as we know, travel still to this day is quite, it's quite PC dominant because people tend to, to book using PC rather than actually book on, on mobile. But it is an interesting question. I mean, we haven't thought of actually segmenting the decision journey for, by device. It's something we can certainly explore to see what that would look like. I mean, my gut instinct would say that when it comes to the actual conversion, that would happen most likely on PC, but it could vary. I mean, it's possible that with low value purchases, you might have conversions also on, on mobile too, rather than just on PC. So it, very interesting feedback. We will definitely be incorporating that as we um, expand and further improve our consumer decision journey analysis. Sarah, one final question for you. Yeah, I was wondering, so these three sub-verticals are, are highly related, one with, with each other. So did you get any information about what is the usual behavior, just for instance, first try to buy the flight, then the hotel, and afterwards the, the car? Are there interactions that you happen to find within this whole process? So it is a view that, is, that, um, that we can generate. It's not one that I've necessarily included today, but when you essentially, the method that we use, we analyze the internet activity, all of it, everything that is searched for these 1,000 users. So we can see what the other, where we can obviously see the, the searches they made that were related to hotels, but we can also see other searches that relate to really anything else, uh, many other things, including um, other sub travel sub verticals like car hire and flights. Um, and so that is information that is available and we are able to see that overlap. So we can see how, like, if, how many it, of the thousand users that we had for hotels, how many also searched for car hire services and how many also searched flights. So we can, we're able to, to capture that overlap. Um, it's something that we can do. It's not something we have included today, but again, that's really good feedback and we can obviously look to incorporate that view because we appreciate that the providers out here that that do more than just hotels and flights, that they actually have multiple services on offer. So thank you very much for that feedback. Thanks very much, Sarah. Rounds of applause. Very good insight and a lot of engaging questions. So let me now introduce you to our next uh, speaker. This is James Murray. He's a uh, um, product marketing manager for Europe. He's been uh, touring a lot uh, recently. Um, beside the destination, um, James is very excited about how you get there and uh, when and how. So that's why he's very much looking forward to what's coming next. So let me introduce James Murray talking to us about the future of search and what it's going to mean for you and your business. James. That was a dreadful photo, okay. <laughs> um, so hello, so uh, my name's James. I uh, am here to talk to you about the future of search. Um, and
And so when uh, we were wondering about what, what were the kind of things that I could talk about today, um, there's so much which is happening and so many um, developments that are going on within search. Sometimes it's really difficult to pick out just like a couple of key things that we wanted to share with you. Um, but I was also keen to make it something which wasn't just about travel. Travel is going to feature clearly in what I'm talking about because you're all here to learn about travel um, from, a, from a Bing and a Microsoft perspective. But what I wanted to do is give you a slightly wider picture as well. And the first thing that I wanted to kind of just start with is that um, I really feel that the future is, is sort of now because it's already here. Most of the stuff that I'm going to be talking about today are products that already exist or trends which are already happening or things which are already sort of um, are pretty fully formed or, or certainly significantly down the track to being something that you can start to invest in today. And so as I go through, I'm going to sort of keep reaching back to some of the things that I'm talking about, about the future being something that, of course, we think about being um, one, two, five, sometimes even 10 years down the line. But what are the things that you can actually start doing today and starting to use and incorporate some of these things that are going to be really important for what you're um, going to need in your business to evolve um, as part of a sort of a, a wider ranging digital transformation? So I thought we'd start with three sort of key trends that have Hopefully, none of these are things which are brand new to you. Some of my sort of naming conventions might be slightly different. But, but the things that you are going to be thinking about or the things that you need to be thinking about um, over the next couple of years, I think, are invisible UI, um, which encompasses a whole bunch of different things from new technologies to digital assistance to voice search, visual search. Um, and the idea that, that we're not going to be um, so constrained to our mobiles anymore. Um, Audience-based buying, something which I think um, we're all very familiar with, and, and that is definitely the way that the industry is moving, um, starting to um, move away from thinking about keywords and thinking about what, who are the people behind those searches. Uh, and the third one, which I'm going to talk a bit about, is big data. Um, I almost feel a bit sort of dirty when I say big data, because it's one of those buzzwords which I hate. Um, but it is nonetheless one of those things that can't be ignored and is absolutely integral to the other um, bits and pieces and these other trends. So I want to walk you through these um, with a few thoughts and ideas of where we're going as Microsoft and as Bing, and then um, take you on a, on a journey as well for what that means specifically for search. So let's start with uh, invisible UI. If you're not familiar with this already, if you haven't seen this already, then you want to start thinking about it. Um, this is something that Google is working on with Levi's, which is a um, piece of uh, touch-sensitive fabric that allows you to make a digital interaction just by stroking it. Now, when we start to think about the idea of invisible UI, this is the kind of thing that we mean you're going to start to be able to have interactions with devices that are, by their very nature, completely screenless. And so in this kind of world, when I can just tap my jacket to get the search information that I need, why would I need a mobile phone anymore? This is ultimately is the thing that you're all driving towards at the moment and the thing that you're most caring about at the moment. But this is not going to be the device of... 20, sort of 25 and beyond. I'm not saying, by the way, that mobile is just going to completely disappear overnight. Of course it's not. It's still going to be incredibly important. But it is something that you need to start thinking about as something that we're moving towards in the future as a world without um, mobiles and without screens. Um, now, this is a retail example of a um, environment where you have no longer any need to have a particular mobile device and you can, um, with holograms, start to pick and choose. In this case, um, someone's picking a chair from an IKEA catalog and he knows already that it's going to fit perfectly in with the rest of his furniture so that the next day when that thing arrives, he doesn't need to worry about, has he got the right color? Is it going to blend in with the rest of his furniture? Because he's already had a perfect rendition with a hologram in real space and time overlaid onto his reality. You're going to see and you're going to have a chance to play with lens a little bit later. And although this is a retail example, think what you could do or think what this might mean for your industries. Imagine being able as a consumer to wear hololens 
and for you to be able to look not just at the weight of your bag, but to see whether it will fit perfectly into the overhead locker in a plane, you'll be able to have a complete 3D hologram of the inside of the plane and check whether your bag will fit. But you'll also be able to check the difference between what does the inside of a plane look like when you're flying with BA, how much legroom do you have, versus how much legroom you might have flying with EasyJet. That could be the deciding factor of the future about whether you book with a particular airline. And these are things which we are trialing and that are all possible today. This is not something in the far-flung future. These are things that we're using today. Now, a corollary of that is that as we start to move away from screens, that we start to get to voice search. We've already mentioned it several times today. Um, by 2020, according to the um, Internet uh, Market Trends Report by Mary Meekan, 50% um, of all search is going to be voice. That's huge. If you look at what we shared today, that around 10% of our traffic is coming uh, through uh, digital assistance, through Cortana and voice, that means that in the next three years, we're going through a massive growth spurt with voice search. But that's not unusual when you think about the proliferation of devices, the ways that we can access, and the ways that people are becoming much more comfortable using voice. So as advertisers, you need to start thinking what are the steps that you can start to take to make sure that your business is future-proofed for voice? Using things like question keywords in your um, campaigns to make sure that you're capturing the way that people are searching when they're using much more natural language than if they're typing. Now, one of the interesting things is that we're seeing a renovation and, and a change in the way that people are searching through voice. And part of that has been driven by the increases in the technology behind voice. Recently, Microsoft had a, a groundbreaking moment where we got to a historic low for um, the error rate of our voice recognition software. Um, what we do is there is, a, there is a standardized test which everyone who is a, um, whether you're human or, or, or machine, um, if you're going to be a translator or a transcriber, you have a certain error um, rate which you're allowed to get from listening to someone's voice and being able to type out the text. Our voice recognition software was the first non-human to pass the transcribing test. And we now have an error rate of less than 6%. That is pretty phenomenal when you think about what that could potentially mean for search. And not only the fact that we now have lower error rates, but also we can do things so much faster. And speed, obviously, is absolutely critical to most of the digital interactions that we have. The faster you can do something, the faster you can process something, the more you're able uh, to be able to make advances with this um, technology. Now, I saw a really interesting um, thing when I was looking through some of the Cortana data. Um, and it speaks to this error rate messaging. Um, clearly, we're not perfect, still within that 6%. There are errors that are made. Um, as I was looking through some of the query data uh, over Christmas last year, there was a, a, a spike of searches for people who were searching for fragile lipstick. And I was confused. Um, but I, I just, this thing stuck out at, at me. I did a couple of searches just to see if this was a brand or, or something that I was missing. Um, but it wasn't, it wasn't a brand. Um, these were people who were um, searching for Mary Poppins. Uh, how to say supercalifragilistic, but it was getting it wrong. So actually we were misinterpreting the, the stage as supercalifragile lipstick XP allodocious. Now, the thing is, is that it took us less than a day to fix that. From noticing and spotting a, a trend or a weird thing, that, uh, an anomaly in our data, to be able to actually recognizing that when someone's doing that, when we have the voice recognition, that now we do actually give you the Mary Poppins video, and so you can all sing along to your heart's content. That is the speed and the rate of consumption and change that we're going through. So not only that, we're now from, I think, from a travel perspective, you know, we're moving away from this idea of um, searching in a box. So where previously you might do a search like this, um, find me flights to New York this weekend, 
you're also going to have to get comfortable not with the, just with the idea of invisible UI, but of UIs which you don't have complete control over. So rather than having a search which you can control um, what ads show up, um, we could very quickly start to see the move to bots where you're starting to have a conversation in Skype and where people are able to interact with your bot but bring it into a conversation so that I could be chatting to my wife over Skype and wondering, planning, where are we going to take our next flight? And the Skyscanner app, or the Skyscanner bot, can start to participate in that conversation in a very natural language way. You're going to have an example of um, some of the bot frameworks in, in the next speaker, so I'm not going to take any more time to talk about that. But I think this is a really fascinating area of development and something that actually any of you could start doing um, today. The final thing, also, just to round off this particular sort of segment of um, this idea of invisible UI is, is visual search because um, we've been thinking about search as a purely sort of text and speech based format but the next evolution of search is very much going to be driven by being able to recognize and understand objects. Um, for those of you who, who um, have ever seen me speak before, if any of you have seen me speak, uh, you'll know that I like to talk about my wife a lot. She tends to give me my best anecdotes for presentations. Uh, so this is a picture of my wife and I on a wedding day. And what I've done is I've shown um, the uh, Microsoft Caption Bot Artificial Intelligence, one of the pictures um, of us uh, on our wedding day. And what it's done is that using visual recognition software is try to pick out what are the key things that are happening in that particular image. Um, so I'm not sure if you can read it, um, so I'll read it out for you, but um, CaptionBot says, um, I'm not really confident, but I think it's a man holding a knife to cut a wedding cake, and he seems not very happy. So first of all, I always have to sort of address the not being happy bit. Um, of course, it was my wedding day, so I was, uh, this was one of the happiest days of my life. I have to say that contractually. Um, but... Uh, the reason why I don't look very happy is because I've been posing and, and sort of smiling for about 40 minutes at this point. I lost all feeling in my, in my cheek. Um, but just look at the complexity of that image and look at how clever the AI has been in order to work out what's going on in that particular photo. First of all, I want to... Um, do we have a point? Yeah. Check this out. Exhibit A. This is not your bog standard wedding cake. Oh no, this is a bespoke, handcrafted Game of Thrones wedding cake that my aunt lovingly made for me. And for those of you who are fans of the show, it has a real life rendering of the Game of Thrones map, the um, armor of the scales worn by Jon Snow, uh, the different houses and the actual throne with the crown and a sword sticking out the top. How on earth did the AI work out that what I was cutting into there was a cake and not some piece of uh, art? Well, it looked at context. Because generally speaking, when you see two, a picture of two people standing next to each other, one of them is wearing a, a white dress and a veil, and they're cutting into something. OK, this is a sword, sword, knife. We'll give it the benefit of the doubt. But generally, what they're cutting into is a wedding cake. Now, we're using this intelligence and this, this AI to be able to truly understand how do we get visual representation and how do we get visual search off the ground. And we're talking to you a little bit about some of the implications that that might have for your business uh, towards the end of the presentation. So if that's uh, invisible UI, um, I wanted to sort of concentrate and just focus a little bit on the idea of audience-based buying. I think we're all very, I'm, I'm literally just going to skip over this in a couple of slides because we all understand the idea that we're moving away from just thinking about keywords and actually what we're doing across all of our digital buying is going towards um, thinking about audiences, moving from searches to searches. Who are the people behind those searches uh, and what are they actually doing? And the, the thing which really makes that um, governable and makes it actionable is data. Um, particularly when you look at the growth of devices and the things that are going on with digital. So the average household now has over six connected devices between them. Um, this is one of my favorites. There are more mobiles in the world than there are toothbrushes. Um, 
And internet uses are, are um, due to grow uh, to 4.2 billion from 3.4 billion by 2019. That's an ex extraordinary amount of consumer data, an extraordinary number of searches which are going to be made. Gathering and harvesting all of that data is going to be absolutely key. Now, the thing is, the speed of adoption of new items and new um, technologies is also absolutely fascinating. So if we take three of the um, technological sort of innovations of the last 100 years or so, the TV, the iPhone, and um, Pokemon Go, obviously. Um, if I was to just walk you through, how long did it take uh, globally to have 100 million users of televisions? Go on. 20 years. 20 years, good guess. A little bit longer, 38 years. Fast forward to um, the launch of the iPhone, any guesses? 100 million iPhones? Five, 10? Less, three years. Here's the big one. How long did it take to get 100 million users of Pokemon Go? 33 days. That is astonishing. And it just goes to show you the rate and the, uh, of evolution and the rate of adoption is going faster and faster and faster. Now, the cool thing is, is that when you have audiences of that magnitude and when you can couple really, really exciting data with it, you can get some really exciting stuff. So this is a non-digital uh, example, but I think is a really telling one. Um, this was a campaign that um, Spotify did for billboards uh, around Brexit. And what they did was they had a look at the data behind the people of what people were actually searching for uh, and what they were um, playing on their playlists. So, so if you can't read it, it says, um, Dear 3,749 people who streamed, it's the end of the world as we know it, the day the, of the Brexit vote. Hang in there. And, and I think that that is really telling and really a uh, lovely little story of using data in a way, data-driven marketing to be able to tell an emotive story, to gather people together, to say, actually, this is not just something that is affecting one or two people. There are 3,000 or nearly 4,000 people who are searching for that specific song because they felt so depressed about the Brexit vote. So if we take these three key trends, invisible UI, audience-based buying, big data, I think these are the things that you're going to need and you need to be thinking about for the future, for the next couple of years and what that means for your business. Now, what do we mean when it comes to search? How am I doing for time, by the way? I always go, okay. So one of the things that I mentioned with the, um, with the facial recognition stuff is that that is all driven by context. And so contextual search is actually really, really important to the next evolution of what we're going to do with some of these um, experiences. So I want to walk you through some of the sort of the four key things that we are thinking at Microsoft about how do we understand contextual search and how do we give you a better experience based on the context of what's happening. So there are four types of context that we're playing around with, uh, environmental, social, um, uh, emotional, and external. Um, and I'm going to walk you through those very, very quickly. So emotional context is really interesting. This is the idea that depending on how you're feeling and depending on your mood, this can dramatically change uh, the thing that you are looking for or the information that you want. From a travel perspective, you can think, you know, never a good idea to try and book a, a holiday when you're feeling um, grumpy. But actually, when the weather is miserable, people are always looking for summer uh, retreats so that they can get better weather. So emotion clearly plays a huge influence in the type of things that we're looking for. Now, there's a really interesting um, thing that happened um, this is uh, Dr. Henry Heimlich. He, he developed the Heimlich maneuver. Unfortunately, this is the best picture that I could find of him, um, and it does look a bit scary, so apologies for that. Um, he actually uh, it, he didn't um, perform the Heimlich maneuver himself until he was 96 years old when he saved somebody's life for the first time. Um, but imagine that uh, from a search perspective uh, that you are searching for Heimlich maneuver. Now, how do we tell what is the right information as a search engine to serve you? Well, we can use um, contextual signals from your emotions using things like um, maybe Microsoft Band or Fitbit to tell what's your heart rate doing? If your heart rate is nice and calm and you're 
uh, at a state of general sort of relax. You might be searching for Heimlich maneuver in order to find out more information about the doctor. However, if your heart rate starts to accelerate and we start to see that you, not only is your heart rate heightened, but as you're using voice search, that the pitch of your voice is strained, well, it's highly likely that the context has changed. And even though you're using the same search, you probably have seen somebody choking in front of you, and actually what you're looking for is instructions on how to deliver the Heimlich maneuver, not information about the doctor. Environmental context is really interesting because what this is is about how do we understand when the environment around you changes, how does that change what's relevant to you? The best example that I have of this is coffee. I love going to Starbucks. Starbucks is my favorite coffee brand, but um, typically I'm only willing to go a little bit further to go to Starbucks than I would to another coffee chain, maybe Costa or Cafe Nero. Now, if the environment changes, I'm more likely to want to get closer to the closest coffee shop rather than my favorite coffee shop. So, if it's sunny, so I've got sunny day, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, I'll happily go to a Starbucks. In fact, I'll walk an extra 100 yards down the road to go to Starbucks. However, if it's raining, then what I want now when I ask for coffee is the closest coffee shop, even if that's not my favorite anymore. Social context is something that I think we all intuitively understand. Um, any of you who are, have ever been in a relationship will know that you are a very different person when you're with your significant other than when you're with colleagues, than when you're with friends and family. Um, for me, for my wife and I, we have a real issue with Netflix because Netflix is um, terrible at trying to make recommendations or trying to understand the differences between our viewing habits. We have one Netflix account, and it's always showing us the same thing, uh, or stuff that we will um, have from sort of shared history rather than stuff that is relevant for me or relevant for my wife. With social context, with the ability to be able to know who's in the room at any one time, or who's actually watching TV versus just sitting on the sofa browsing through social media, we have the ability now to be able to say, James, you're watching TV, why don't you watch the next episode of Game of Thrones. Nita, you're watching TV with James. Why don't you watch something you both like, like Bake Off? Nita, you're watching TV by yourself. You can watch uh, Desperate Housewives or, or some of the crap that she likes watching. <laughs> and the final one is external context. This is really hard to be able to characterize because it's all of those other things that can make the difference and be changing your perspective on what's relevant. And so the only way that I can really think about this is um, like when we're going through a change for something like Brexit, the global context of what that means is going to change the information that we need uh, in a given environment. Now the people who really understand this are Disney. Disney are amazing at external context because what they do is they change the story that they deliver by a small bit to make it relevant to each individual audience that they deliver it to. So I thought as we're in Barcelona, I would show you two versions of the same trailer, one in English and one in Spanish, and I want to show you how they understand external context. Hopefully the volume works. So, how was the first day of school? It was fine, I guess. I don't know. Do you ever look at someone and wonder what is going on inside their head? Did you guys pick up on that? Sure mm -hmm. did. Oh. Something's wrong. We're gonna find out what's happening, but we'll need support. Signal the husband. <clears throat> With a nice pass over the reef, comes across center ice. <clears throat> Uh-oh, she's looking at us. What did she say? What? Oh, oh, sorry, sir. No one was listening. Is it garbage night? Uh, we left the toilet seat up. What? What is it, woman? What? Signal him again. Ah, so, Riley, how was school? Todas lo vieron, ¿verdad? Sí. Le pasa algo. Averiguaremos lo que pasa, pero con apoyo. Hazle señas al esposo. Oh, oh, no se está mirando. Eh, ¿Qué fue lo que dijo? ¿Qué? Oh, oh, lo siento, señor. Nadie escuchó nada. ¿Sacar la basura? ¿El asiento del sanitario? ¿Qué? ¿Qué quieres, mujer? ¿Qué? Hazle otra seña. 
Ah, oye, Riley, ¿qué tal la escuela? ¿Qué es eso? Okay, so even if you don't speak Spanish, hopefully you can see that the joke still works. But the key thing there is the external context. The first one I showed you was the Canadian release. And so for the Canadians, the biggest sport that they have is ice hockey. The second one was for the South American release. In Chile, they don't do ice hockey, they do football. And therefore, they change the subtle nuance of the um, story that they're telling in order to make it relevant to the people who are going to be watching it. That's external context. Now, if we take these four together, we we'll think that we're about to go into a new era of search where context is going to be king. The thing that dr drives ultimately the best conversions that we have is not going to be about content. You can have the best content in the world, but if you don't have the right context, you're never going to get your content in front of the right people. How are we doing for time now? Two minutes. All right, I'm going to really rattle through. All right, so I told you at the beginning that the future is now because it's already here. So one of the things that I wanted to talk about was emotion. Emotional context, we, we, we said, was really important. Emotion works brilliantly for marketers because if you can make an emotional connection with your um, customers, they're more likely to buy from you. And so using emotion in tech is actually really interesting. It's one of the things that we're playing with is the idea of how can we take live feeds of people's faces to try and diagnose what emotion they're feeling at any given time. How could we use that as a potential another signal to be able to understand the emotional context that they're in? And just to finally finish off, there's a, a brilliant project that we're doing with, with Uber. So I wanted to bring it back to travel. Um, one of the things that why you have to put yourself in the customer's shoes, why do people take Uber? Well, they go through different emotional states. Initially, when they originally order an Uber, the thing that's primarily driving them is probably convenience and price. But of course, the moment that you actually step into that car, your emotional state changes. Now you know you're going to take a journey and you expect to go somewhere, but the emotional driver is very, very different. The thing that you're interested in in this case is trust and safety. So this is a really cool piece of technology that we're using some of that same facial recognition technology in order to help Uber provide trust to their customers. We come to work every day to pilot, test, and launch new technology solutions Real-time ID check is the latest technology example where we at Uber are constantly developing and testing new solutions to predict, prevent, and reduce security risks in ways that weren't possible before. It's through this partnership with Microsoft that we've been able to develop this technology quickly and ensure that every rider and every driver has an excellent experience. Real-time ID check is a prompt that appears in the driver's app asking them to take a self photo. We can do a check in real time to make sure that that identity of the person who took the picture matches the account holder who's been approved to drive. Doing that serves a couple of purposes. Drivers know that their identities and their accounts are being protected, and riders know that the driver who they're with has been screened. Jen? Evan? Uh, yeah. Real-time ID is a smart technology. What that means is it factors in and addresses the edge cases. The situation where the driver is wearing glasses or a hat and they weren't in the identification that we have on file. The beautiful thing is it can recognize these changes and ask the driver to remove their sunglasses or retake the photo. The partnership with Microsoft Cognitive Services allowed us to go from idea to execution to implementation across the country in a matter of months. Already, we've been able to make thousands of rides safer, and very soon we're going to be making millions of rides safer through this technology. I hope you'll agree that's a pretty cool piece of uh, innovation there. Um, but ultimately what it's about is unlocking human potential. This is where we see the future of search evolving. And by the way, that thing that you just saw there, that's search. You might not think of it as search because somebody didn't go to a laptop and type something into a box, but it's search technology and it's Bing which is actually enabling and making that process happen. We firmly believe that these are some of the things that you're going to need to think about in your business in order to drive you forward. And we definitely want to be there as your partner to drive forward with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, James. And James will be here also tonight during the dinner. So there's also time for questions tonight during the dinner. Thank you very much, James. 
So, it's a very exciting time where we're living in, and uh, especially if the developments on search, if they go like we show you, it's going to be very exciting. And as you've understood probably is that search and Bing within Microsoft has been a birthplace for Microsoft, for my machine learning and for artificial intelligence. We needed those capabilities to process all the huge amount of data that are coming to us by web indexing, but also to social, social signals. In that case, we needed those capabilities to understand the user intent when they're typing a keyword into a search box. So now that we have developed that muscle of search, it's time to bring those uh, cognitive competencies and cognitive services back to the bigger Microsoft, but also to you, to our partners and our customers in, in form of the API. Our next speaker knows everything about that, because I'm going to announce you Esther. Esther de Nicolas Benito, she is our next speaker, and she's actually a chief evangelist within Microsoft. And Esther is, actually has a degree in telecommunication engineering, and she specialized in microelectronics and robotics even. Uh, she has some sweet spots, which is all in that same area. And she knows everything about all the new technology, which you can apply also to your own business, so we can bring our learnings to you. So it's my great pleasure to announce to you Esther de Nicolas Benita. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So I'm the geek one here. <laughs> so I'm going to uh, speak about artificial intelligence. And I know what some of you might be thinking. This is kind of the digital transformation thing, right? So every technical event I'm going to, they're going to speak about artificial intelligence. Well, the bad news is that, yeah, we are doing this. <laughs> so you are going to listen about artificial intelligence for all the technical events you will be going in the upcoming months, but there's a good reason for that. Another thing you might be thinking about is that, why are we now speaking so much about artificial intelligence? By all means, this is not something new. Do you remember when Gary Kasparov, Kasparov was beaten by Deep Blue playing chess? Do you remember that? It was 20 years ago. I looked it up yesterday on Bing. 20 years ago. It's been a long time, so why are we now so hyped about artificial intelligence? What's the news in this? So actually what we are seeing now is the perfect timing for artificial intelligence to become useful for all of you, for all of us, for all the people that are building things on top of uh, what used to be, um, let's say, dedicated to academic research or for very big companies with a lot of technological investment. We have three motions that are making artificial intelligence available for everyone. So the first thing is that we have a lot of information. Everyone has a lot of information in their business. You have information about your customer's intention when they search on your web page. You have information on the social media. You have information, I don't know, from wearables, from mobile devices, from, from everything. James uh, talked about that before. So now we have the information for artificial intelligence, but, but we also need other things. We need very, uh, a very powerful supercomputer to take advantage of, of that information. And never before in human history have uh, we have had access to this amazing amount of computing power before. So that's why now it's really easy to go into artificial intelligence because we are democratizing it. It's becoming something that everyone can do with just two lines of code in whatever application you're designing. And this is something that's huge. And that's why everyone is so, speaking so much about artificial intelligence. And the third thing is that you need algorithms to make everything work. And this used to be like a big blocker because not all of us have mathematics, mathematicians working for us. But now these algorithms are publicly available. The rise of open source is, is allowing everyone to have access to this kind of information, to this kind of, of knowledge, of math, mathematical knowledge that can allow you to create this kind of experiences for your customers. So this is why now it's possible to bring artificial intelligence to everything that you might be thinking about doing in the future. And that is a big business, in fact. So these are some numbers from IDC um, that I wanted to show you, not because, I mean, Pretty much, you might be thinking, well, that's business for Microsoft, right? 
Yes, it is. But the, think about the investments that people are doing in this technology. It is real, it is growing, and it's, it's going to grow even more exponentially. Because the technology is really powerful, and people are realizing all the things they can do with that. And, you know, there are some verticals where this is being huge, like banking, for example, for fraud prevention, or healthcare for disease uh, detection and prevention, or, for example, um, manufacturing with the Internet of Things. You might have heard about Internet of Things, right? It's huge. I mean, manufacturing is uh, it's really driving a lot of efficiencies. So all of these combined are driving um, more than $18 billion revenues in 2020. So that's a huge amount of, of money that people are investing in, in this kind of cognitive applications that James were, was mentioning before. But when we talk about artificial intelligence, there are a lot of misconceptions. What are we really talking about when we are talking about artificial intelligence? There are two concepts behind artificial intelligence. One is the broad artificial intelligence, which means machines that can think like humans. That would be like Terminator, for example. Uh, to be a little less dramatic, that could be something like her. Have you seen the movie Her? It is a digital assistant that um, learns a lot about the, the world when she is unleashed. Um, this is, we are far from there. So it's, we are really far from creating an artificial intelligence that can really learn itself uh, new tricks, right? So going back to the first example I was giving you, the Deep Blue example with Gary Kasparov, um, Deep Blue might be able to win Gary Kasparov playing chess, but put a tic-tac-toe in front of them. <laughs> it doesn't have an idea of where even to start. Even if you explain it through, uh, through voice, it cannot learn it. So this is a big differentiation between human beings and artificial intelligence. But there is the other concept of artificial intelligence, which is narrow AI. I'm going to stop saying artificial intelligence because it's kind of long, so I'm going to go for AI. So if we, if we look at narrow AI, this is where the singularity point is uh, we've gotten there, right? So machines are better than us in narrow actions, such as, for example, voice recognition. They have a less error rate, as James mentioned, that, than human translator. On vision recognition, they're better than us as well. So imagine uh, there are sometimes a lot of, uh, you know, conversations about the connected vehicles. Uh, cars, intelligent cars, AIs, are better detecting, for example, a child going uh, quickly on the street. They detect that faster and, and more, let's say, more accurately than us. So um, machines are becoming better than us in narrow uh, spaces of intelligence. So the, the, the dimensions on where AI is, uh, is really growing more powerful, powerful every day is vision recognition, so the, the ability like uh, the caption board, the ability to see uh, a picture and understand what's going on there. The speech recognition, the ability to hear something and uh, um, turn it into text or translate it or do whatever it needs to do with that. Then the language understanding, which is different to speech recognition. A machine could uh, just transcript whatever you're saying, but don't un doesn't, wouldn't understand a word, just translate it, right? But the language understanding, is, is a major breakthrough that we recently have. And this is what's enabling us to uh, build bots and build digital assistants. <clears throat> because as a developer, if you think about the amount of different phrases, sentences, you could use to ask for a flight. You could say, I want to fly to New York. I'm looking for a trip to New York. I'm, I don't know, there are thousands of them. So imagine as a developer that you would have to program every single possibility to build your application. That would be impossible, right? So now AI can understand the intent behind the language so that you don't need to program all that. And this is a major breakthrough to make all this vision a reality. And last but not least is the ability to link knowledge, to understand um, a text or a conversation 
and to link that to other uh, signals across whatever it is you're doing. Like, for example, it could link a conversation you're having with someone to your um, calendar in Office 365 or whatever other technology you're using, and it could remind you of something you told someone you would send. For example, if I'm, I'm telling you I'm going to drop you an email tomorrow to discuss whatever, my digital assistant could say tomorrow, hey, you told him that you were going to send an email, so just do it. And this is connecting different um, AIs to bring knowledge into the table. So this is how computers are now understanding the world, and they're doing that really better than us. So this is where the AI business is exploding right now. So what do we, what do we mean when we say we are democratizing AI? What do we mean when we say this is going to be available for everyone? So basically, we are talking about four things. At least from Microsoft's perspective, we're talking about four dimensions of AI. The first one is, is agents, and we have discussed this a lot, and we will, uh, we will talk about this again. Uh, the second one is applications, and I'm not going to go into details, but I just want you to know that everything I will be telling you uh, in this presentation, we are building it into our own applications. So uh, whether it is Office, Windows, all the Microsoft applications you, you all know, they are all being infused with this kind of AI, um, AI cognitive services. Then we have the services that allow you to take all this power that Bing uh, has, all this knowledge that Bing has uh, on the world, and build your own, uh, or your own applications on, on top of that with just a, a pair of lines of, of code. And it not only allows you to do that with the knowledge that Bing has, but it also allows you to personalize that for your specific needs. And for example, um, if we go back to the caption bot James was showing, it is great that we can see that there are a couple, um, you know, with a sword uh, going to a cake and so on. But if I was selling a wedding, a wedding dresses, I would like the AI to tell the, the person, okay, so this wedding dress is for Pronovias from collection 2014, and you can buy that from my store. For example, there's no way Bing on its own can know all that for all the possible businesses that are, are, are across the world. So the powerful, the power on AI and the beauty on those services is that they, you can personalize them and train them for your specific uh, business needs. And this is really powerful, and that's what will, allow, uh, will enable you to, um, to bring these amazing experiences for your customers. And last is infrastructure. And I'm not going to go into this because it's super geeky, but <laughs> I, if, if any of you is interested in understanding from an infrastructure pers perspective why we claim to have the most powerful AI supercomputer in the world, then by all means, just ask me, and I will be uh, happy to explain and go into a lot of detail on that. So the first thing is agents, and we've spoken a lot about Cortana and how this is going to grow or not grow. We have had a little bit of uh, debate there. So I just wanted to tell you some interesting uh, facts about some AIs that we are launching across the world. <clears throat> so I'm not sure if you have, you've heard about Xiaois. Does that ring a bell for any of you? No. So um, one of the things we're doing with, um, with the digital assistants is to try to make them more empathetic. Is it how it's said in English? Empathetic or empathic? Empathetic? Empathetic, thanks. With the British accent, empathetic. Okay, so we're trying to make Cortana more empathetic. And for that, we need to train, the, to train it. So we need to um, create this kind of experiences where people can discuss their feelings with an AI. And we did that, that's how it is. We did that in China. And we created an AI that doesn't, that, that doesn't do anything but listen to people and just uh, learn from that feelings. And uh, interestingly enough, 40 million people in China use Xiaois every day. We have had lots of love declarations <laughs> to Xiaois. And uh, we have tried to detect sarcasm in that, and no, they were true. So people are getting more and more used to speaking with AIs. And that's happening in China, but in Japan, we run a similar experiment that's called RINA, and 20% of Japanese population is using RINA at least once per week. 
just to talk about their things. So people are increasingly more comfortable speaking with assistants or with AIs. So that means that this vision where people will uh, replace um, applications for, for, for bots and web browsers for a digital assistant is really uh, going to happen. So it's more a question of when than if, if it's going to happen, because it will. So if we uh, speak about Cortana, there are the, it has uh, 133 million of users worldwide, which is huge. But if we add up to, um, as they mentioned, Siri and Alexa, which also are built on, on, on Bing, that's an incredible amount of knowledge that we are creating. And what we're trying to do is to make this available across any device, so that Cortana doesn't need, really need to live in your uh, mobile or in your laptop. It can live in your refrigerator, it, it can live in your car. So if you're planning to, <clears throat> to create this kind of um, digital assistance, you might rely on Cortana or you might create your own digital assistant and um, build it on Bing, like, just like Alexa uh, or Amazon did with Alexa. So I'm going to show you a little video of what BMW, uh, BMW is doing with, uh, with us to create their own digital assistant, which builds on Cortana and connects you to your business, uh, to your business reality. Good morning, David. Your first meeting today will be at 9.30 downtown with Mr. Brannigan. Would you like to choose your driving options? Decker Canyon with the I-8 will be at Joyride this morning. Yes, thanks for the suggestion. Be careful, David. There's a rock slide ahead. Call Caroline. David, how are you? Hi, Caroline. Fine, thank you. I sent you an email with the two possible headline press pictures. Is it possible for you to take a look at them right now? I'll look at them when I arrive at the office. We should go for lunch when I'm back in Munich next week. I see Thursday could work. It does. Looking forward to it. There's traffic ahead. To keep your estimated arrival time, we suggest leaving the highway at exit 5 for an alternative route downtown. So this video shows different dimensions of what we were speaking before. It shows holograms, how we are integrated holograms with the driving experience, and it also shows this integration with, um, with the digital assistant, which connects to Cortana, for example, to find an available slot for a meeting. So this is a kind of connected experiences that we are talking about when we're talking about AI. So I'm going to show you a real uh, bot that, uh, that's actually in production and being used, the Hipmunk bot. Um, let me, because I cannot, hope you hear me. Can you hear me? Great. So I'm going to open my Skype account and move a little bit here so I can see. So this is my real Skype account. Hipmunk is uh, a contact that I have in my, in my account which is great because I don't have to download anything to reach the service. It's just another contact that I have, just like my mom or my husband or my friends, right? So if I'm trying to go into um, a travel, let me, okay, please. So I just say, hi, Hipmunk. For example, I could just say, hello, whatever this is the uh, language understanding service as I was, I was speaking about before, right? So the fact that, it understands me no matter how I say the things. Even if, if I mistype, it will understand me. So depending on our internet connection, we should receive an answer, hopefully. This is the demo effect. <laughs> okay, for, for some reason it appears that's the thing with live demonstrations. So for some reason, Although we're connected to the internet, or so it seems. And I swear it was working before. No, it is connected. Yep. Okay. 
So not sure, let's, let's just give it a little while to see if it's a problem of Skype. If not, I can show it to you later. But what I wanted to show you, and in fact I can do it showing, showing you uh, previous conversations I was having with Hipman, precisely um, trying to uh, prepare this demo. And sorry about that, but, but the, the desktop is not... Um, I really cannot even go up. No, I cannot scroll. No, it's because, uh, well, it doesn't matter. But, you know, if you see here, I'm not going to waste more time here, but if you see here, the thing is that I can speak with Hipmunk, and it, it, it showed, before I just uh, told him, I, I'm planning to go to the Louvre to, uh, to see um, some of the, my favorite pictures. And he said, okay, so you're looking for flights from Barcelona to, to Paris. So he detected not only where I was, but also what was my intention after, uh, with my query. And it showed me some interesting flights. It looked up uh, with the information I provided and um, found the flights, okay, <laughs> and found the flights that I was interested in too, and showed me different options. And it showed me different options into my contacts. So as you see, it showed me options uh, where I can just browse through them inside my Skype, my Skype account and just choose that. And uh, what's great about this is that when you build a bot, not only you are more easily discoverable, but you also can convert this into a Cortana skill, meaning that when someone speaks to Cortana, you, it, Cortana can connect to that bot to provide the service. So it doesn't matter um, if you are not even using Skype. Cortana could do that for you. So this is as important as three years ago was to have your own application, right? So this is really being huge. And now we are currently uh, speaking about how Cortana can convert these bots into skills. But imagine what we can convert this, um, this kind of bots into skills for whatever digital assistance you might be using. That's our vision. That's what we are trying to do. Oh, <laughs> so it, uh, it woke up. Great. So, uh, for example, if I say, I'm feeling a little bit stressed because my demo is not working. <laughs> So, for example, I tell you that um, I want to go to the beach. For example, I could just say that in, in whatever possible uh, mean. And for some reason, internet is going really, really slow. So, really, we're not even going to try anymore. But the thing is that um, you get the power of this, right? So, I'm not leaving Skype for anything. And it's not only Skype. The beauty about the... Okay, so see, it detected that I'm in Barcelona right now because of my IP address. And uh, it's just showing, it's going to show me different possible uh, beach getaways. If I had told it I'm going to go to Mallorca, it would have shown me all, only Mallorca. It's, uh, it's searching. But this is, uh, like James mentioned, a new way of doing search based on my emotions, based on uh, natural language. And it's not only Skype, as I was mentioning. You can create one bot and connect it to a lot of different um, social media applications. So whether you're using Facebook, whether you're using um, Click, Telegram, I don't know, <laughs> just name it. There's a, okay. So there's the same uh, code that you build just once, and make it discoverable for everyone on any social application they might be using. So this is really powerful. And this is a new way to make your products and your services discoverable. And, uh, well, great that it worked. Thanks, Bertram. So, moving back. So, as you can see, this is uh, really going to change how people um, look for different products and services because it is happening. People are feeling more and more comfortable speaking with machines. So, the next thing that I want to talk to you about is the services that 
um, will allow you to build these kind of things. Because a bot can um, provide you with this kind of travel information, but it can also detect a picture. Like, for example, I could just um, upload a picture of a very beautiful beach that I show in Instagram, for example, and say, hey, recommend me something like that, but on this budget. And it can look and find similar um, beaches across the world and find, that, and find somewhat, something that is closer to me and cheaper. And uh, this is something that we can do with this kind of services. We, we can mix and create the applications that we want to do. So let me stop a little bit and tell you about the three layers of artificial intelligence, okay? So the first layer, the most, the, the deepest layer, is what we call deep learning. Have you, maybe you have heard about the concept of, this, of deep learning. Deep learning is basically uh, recreating how neurons work in, inside the brain um, to allow the computer to learn new things. So this is basically when you're planning to do something that is very specific, like for example, you are planning to build a medical AI application that goes through a very specific disease. Um, of course, you're not going to find out-of-the-box solutions for that. So you build your own neural network to, um, to have that solution. Pretty much like what IBM did with uh, TESS for, for Deep Blue. Then the second layer of that <clears throat> is machine learning. So you, you abstract yourself from that first layer and you just create an algorithm, create a model, and just train it to be more effective, okay? So this is basically what we could be doing, um, training an algorithm to be more effective, classifying uh, whatever, right? So um, finding dogs, for example, or whatever thing that you might be uh, thinking about. And then there's the top layer, the, the most abstract one, which is um, the cognitive services. This um, ability to just use the power of Bing instead of having to program it yourself. This saves you years of development. So it's, it's not a, I mean, the fact that we are offering that to everyone for a really, really cheap uh, price is great. You're getting into years of R&D from Microsoft to build your own applications. And what's really interesting is that we have created a system that gives you this level of, of, of abstraction but also gives you the ability to train it. So it's kind of in the middle of layer two and layer three, right? Sorry about being a little bit too technical, but this is important for you to understand it because it's, it's what will make you able to build specific solutions. So with these cognitive services, we can do pretty much everything you can think about. We can detect emotions, for, so, for example, if I'm looking at, a, at an advertising, you could detect how, am I, how, am I, how I'm feeling looking at that. What's, uh, you could detect my age, my gender. You could see if I, I'm getting interested in that ad. You could create a lot of intelligent uh, experiences on that. You can create, as I told you, um, language understanding services. You can um, create a vision recognition, you can create just whatever you think about. You can mix and match all these cognitive services and build a super AI capable of doing a lot of incredible things. I'm going to tell you one example. Um, we saw some examples before, right? Like Uber. Uber is a great example of vision recognition. How you can use vision recognition to solve the need for security. And um, uh, we were before, Simon was um, um, telling us about the Airbnb problem, right? The, the burglars that Airbnb customers were doing. This could be solved the same way we solved Uber's security issue with face recognition. So there's a lot of potential opportunities here. But a, a very specific case that I want to uh, tell you is McDonald's. Because what we did with McDonald's is use speech recognition to automatize the process of ordering taking on the, on the drive through There are little environments when you uh, think about uh, speech recognition, less friendly than a drive through <laughs> Really. <laughs> There's a lot of noise. The uh, sampling of the, of the sound is awful. We're talking about four kilohertz. It's, it's really awful. Worse than a phone conversation. Really, really awful. So of course, um, out of the box, a cognitive service cannot understand 
what a Big Mac is and uh, the different options that it can have with a menu. And by any means, it can understand it when you're in a car talking to the drive-thru, right? So we trained the system. We built this AI system and we trained it specifically for McDonald's. And I'm going to show you how it works. Good afternoon, welcome to McDonald's. May I take your order? Yes, I would like two Happy Meals, uh, one cheeseburger and one chicken McNuggets, both with fries and apples, one with a chocolate milk and one with a small orange juice. Um, also give me two cheeseburgers, both of those no onion and one of those no ketchup as well, um, one fry and a large coffee, two cream, three sugars. Would you like that fry to be large? Uh, yes, thank you. Would you like barbecue sauce with those nuggets? No, sweet and sour. Is the order on your screen correct? Yes. Okay, your total is 1468, please pull around to the first window. Okay, so you see, it is difficult to understand it, even if you're listening careful to that. But the machine is not only able to transcript the, the exact conversation that, um, that the customer was having, but also turn it automatically into an order for the system, so that the uh, girl on the other side of the line is just focusing on creating a good experience for the customer and um, cooking the meal. So instead of just, you know, being concentrated on understanding and taking the orders, you can do other things. And this is just an example of what we can do with this kind of um, trainable um, cognitive services. And um, some of the things that AI will enable to do uh, because we, I'm, I'm, I have tried to, um, let's say, focus on the travel vertical, but there are a lot of other things that AIs will allow us to do. So, for example, intelligent healthcare. Um, and this is great because um, Simon was speaking about Zika in Miami. And this is one of the things that we are working on with uh, AI at Microsoft. So, the picture that you see there, you see that, uh, that strange, weird, black thing? That's an intelligent mosquito trap. So what we're doing with this intelligent mosquito trap is to um, find mosquitoes with some specific diseases like Zika or Dengue or this kind of pandemic diseases. So we detect uh, intelligently which kind of bug the, the seeds on the trap. So th there's a drone uh, flying with this trap and different bugs sit on the, on the trap. And we detect first if it's a mosquito or it's not. That's through the visual recognition, okay? So we use the visual AI and say, okay, this is a mosquito, this is not. And then we say, okay, but if it's a mosquito, what kind of, of mosquito it is? Because not all the mosquitoes carry the same diseases. So, this is a trivial um, question, so if you're ever playing trivial and this question arises, just please remember me. So the difference between the different kind of mosquitoes is the frequency of how they move their wings. Okay? Uh, this is a very interesting thing. So what we do is detect that frequency with AI and then trap only the specific mosquitoes that can carry a specific disease. Then we extract blood from that and we put it to a machine learning system that will tell you if the mosquito is carrying a disease and what was the last animal it fed uh, from, right? So that gives us information if there's a disease in the, in the rural outskirts of a specific city and also if there are other animals being impacted because when a single human is infected with a pandemic, it's too late. So what we're trying to do is to prevent this from happening. And the same way we're doing this, we're doing that with a lot of different diseases. Uh, AI is allowing doctors across the world to be more precise, for example, medicating pa patients. There are a lot of different diseases that don't have a specific medication, right? So it depends on the patient. So you, um, let's say you, do, you tell the patient to use some drugs and then you, um, by trial and error, you correct the, the, the doses that you are uh, giving the patient. That has a lot of human cost for the patient. But it's, what we are doing now is to um, simulate, model 
how the biological components of the, of the body works in an AI system, so, so that you infuse a specific drug, and you get the output on how it's going to work. So that's uh, helping doctors be much more precise on the way they are helping their patients. And this is just only the beginning of what we are doing with AI on, on healthcare. This is all real life things that we're working on. On transportation, we spoke about connected vehicles, but think about all the possibilities that it brings us. It's not only um, self-driving cars. It's also, for example, if Cortana detects that I'm uh, going to have a call in half an hour and I'm going to take 45 minutes to get to the office, it might not get me to the, through the fastest route because I'm not going to get in time. It might choose the route with better connectivity so that I can connect to the call from the car, for example. So by connecting these kind of different signals, it can really help me do what I really want to do. So this is, kind, again, kind of how we're connecting the dots. And in, in smart agriculture, this is also huge. Um, uh, the last thing I read about that is that uh, with the population increase that we're having in the world, we should double our, agri our agriculture production uh, by year 2030 to make sure that we will be able to feed the human race. This is huge. This is uh, a, a real challenge for all of us. So the only way that we are going to be able to do this, to do this is, is with AI, is with this kind of technologies, with Internet of Things, understanding how everything on a farm works, and providing this technology to not only farms in United States or Japan or uh, developed countries, but also in, in areas where they don't have Internet connectivity, where they don't have computers. So we need to really make this accessible for everyone if we want to uh, really work. And that's everything I wanted to tell you. I'm, I'm, I'm going to um, leave you with a video that we created five years ago. And it's interesting because five years ago, it was super futuristic, right? It was like science fiction. And you will see that although interfaces might be different, the core technology in this video already exists. So when we're saying how we um, think about the future of um, agents and so on, Really, we are hitting the spot if you look at this video. So um, let's look at that. Uw aandag alsjeblieft. Welcome to Johannesburg International Airport. Please approach the road to create your pickup zone.
Okay, so that's it. As you can see, although the, the interfaces are different, all the technology is there. So that's it from my side. Uh, do we have time for questions? <laughs> okay. You're here for dinner, right? Or for drinks um, afterwards? I will so be here a little can... while, not for dinner, but a little while questions. I will. Yeah. Thanks so much, Thank Esther. You. Thanks very much. So before we close and wrap up, I wanted to first thank um, everyone in the audience and every speaker for their uh, thought-provoking, aspiring uh, conversations and uh, interventions. I want everyone to leave with three main takeaways today. So as we all agree, the travel industry is in a major transformation coming from uh, new offerings, customer behavior, obviously the flood of new technologies and new ways of, uh, of leveraging those technologies. In any transformation, everybody needs to be surrounded with good partners. And um, at Microsoft, we feel that we have our technology that can help you uh, achieve uh, future goals. Um, we also have the Bing audience, have you seen uh, earlier on that is keep growing. So again, uh, helping you to support your future growth and future aspirations. And most of all as well, your local account teams and the people who've uh, also made the trip to uh, be with you today, who are here to also help you create those uh, intel intelligent connections to achieve more. So let me now pass on to Masha for the rest of the agenda. Thank you, Alex. Uh, yes, and not unimportant. Um, some of you didn't check in yet. Uh, in the hotel. So there will be taxis, like I said in the beginning, it will be taxis as from 6.30 until 7.45 to the hotel. So you can freshen up or check in. Those who already checked in or don't want to go to the hotel, you can stay here if you like, because there's also going taxis from here directly to the dinner venue. So, and where is the dinner? Because we didn't reveal that yet. Well, we wanted to also uh, end the day in style before, of course, we go to the next speaker, but this evening, we will end the day in style, and we have reserved uh, for a majestic dinner tonight at the Xalet de Montieu, which is another historical place here in Barcelona. Um, some really great events, uh, the facilities of this restaurant have hosted some great events like the uh, Universal Exhibition of uh, 1929 even, but also the Olympic Games of uh, 1992. They've hosted some of the activities around that. Um, you will literally have, because it will, it's very high, you will literally have Barcelona at your feet. Before we go to the next speaker, which will be announced by Alex, um, after that speaker, you have the opportunity to try on the HoloLens. And because we are with a pretty big group, and we don't want people to fight over HoloLens, of course, uh, you have on your badge a group number. That's group one or group two. So group one, they will start with a tour, with a private tour here around the brewery, which is very interesting. Group two will start with the HoloLens, with the try on the HoloLens. Then after 30 minutes, we will switch. So group one can do the HoloLens and group two can see a little bit more about the brewery. If you have any questions on that, you can either ask Alex or me, but there's even, even people that know a lot more, a lot better than us. That's Andrea, Bertram, and Barbara. They're over there. They have been live streaming with their phone this entire event, you know, side by the turn by turns. And I also want to take the opportunity to give a big applause for this team who have made this event for us here. Thank you very much. Up to Alex to announce our last speaker, because that's not in this room, but in the room next to us. So there was a very futuristic video. No, now, now let's go to the future, but kind of reality as well, with Andrea Benedetti. He heads um, the technical evangelism from Italy, and we're very excited because we managed to get him here and have two other lens for you to trial as well. In, uh, as you'll see, it's very exciting, futuristic, and still very in the moment and here. So I invite you, I think group two, to move to the other room to trial for the oh, next 30 everybody minutes. Everybody can go there for the...
presentation and after that we will divide ourselves in groups. So everybody is requested to go into the other room for the final presentation of today. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Welcome everybody also from my side. Um, this is the last session of today. Maybe interesting session. Uh, I have a couple of slides, not so high number of slides. It's a little bit it's a little difficult or strange for Microsoft. I have uh, just a few slides. Um, in the last video from Esther, you have seen a couple of holographics, uh, hologram, holographic world. Um, this is not the future, this is the present. And the idea of today is to present to you the HoloLens. I am Andrea, I work for Microsoft Italy as a technical evangelist uh, director. So my work is just to talk and speech about technology, future scenario, and so on. Uh, today, I present to you the first holographics computer in the world, the Microsoft HoloLens. Just to, uh, before to present the device, I want to uh, introduce or resume uh, the three different types of reality that we have. Maybe you know the virtual reality, or maybe you already tried the virtual reality. So, uh, for example, when you put on your head a headset and uh, walk on the summit of Himalaya when you stay in your office. So the big uh, idea of the virtual reality is to uh, have another environment totally, completely different that you have. The first thing of virtual reality is that you don't know nothing about your real environment, but your eyes and your body and your mind receive input totally different uh, because you are seen. There is a problem for virtual reality, is the motion sickness. When your brain receives different inputs from your eyes and your ears, you start to go in shutdown mode in a sort of blue screen and uh, starting to have a problem, physical problem. This is the reason why virtual reality at the moment don't have a, a very uh, uh, huge, very important uh, utilization around the world. From the other side, augmented reality is more or less the simple reality because you can put some virtual layer on the physical uh, world. For example, you can use your phone, you can see a street, and you receive on your phone some information like, uh, this is a beautiful restaurant, if you walk away for 2,000 meters to the left, you can find another restaurant, and so on. You can have just simple uh, virtual information on your physical layer. But the important thing is that the virtual information don't know nothing about your physical uh, world. Maybe you know the game Pokemon Go. The Pokemon Go is a fantastic example of augmented reality. You can put here a Pokemon and you can bring it. But if you have a hole on your floor, your Pokemon don't know that and stay here in the air. Mixed reality is the totally different world. For the first time, you can receive input from your physical world and work on that with create some virtual layer and holographics things. HoloLens is the first computer, holographic computer, that you can use to understand in real time the real environment and interact with them just to put inside holographics and uh, uh, virtual layer. We done a natural way to interact, so gesture and voice. You can uh, command your HoloLens with your hands or your voice. With technology totally built from Microsoft, and you can create holograph just to enhance the real world. This is the device. I have a couple of devices today. And uh, the first thing that I want to uh, present to you is, this is a computer. This is a Windows 10 computer. Uh, the same Windows 10 that you have on your laptop, or on your phone, or your Xbox. It's the same. 
just created for holographic computer. Inside of, of the device, you have all the, the sensor, all the power supply, all the battery, all the CPU, and so on, to have a computer. You don't need nothing, cable, or other things. Today, I have another uh, laptop, is here, just to share uh, what I can see, so you can see on the screen what I do with my device. But if I turn off my laptop, you can continue to use the HoloLens without any problem. So this is a complete PC. Inside, it's a really interesting technology. Maybe you know Kinect, the technology that coming from Xbox for gaming. Inside of the device, you have four different camera that are Kinect sensor. So the camera are able to understand your gesture and to understand the objects that there are on the physical environment. There is a HDMI camera and a camera, uh, infrared camera. Four different microphones just to understand and listen the environment around the, us. Just to be honest, today it's a little bit complicated, the demo, because we have a strange light, a projector, and a couple of cameras. But I'm really optimistic. Um, in front of your eyes, you have a transparent lens. And this is another uh, totally difference between HoloLens and all other uh, devices that come from other, for example, competitors. Uh, when you have a transparent lens, you can see your physical environment. So you don't have any physical problem because you stay in your physical world and just receive other virtual layer thanks to holographics uh, engine. So the projector put on your transparent lens the holograms so you can interact with, with virtual world on your physical world. The HPU Maybe you know the term CPU is surpassed. Cheap HPU, holographic processing unit, are a couple of processor units that you have inside of HoloLens. And this is the engine that receives in real time a ton of data from all the sensor just to understand the environment and create the holographics for your eyes, for your experience. The HPU are uh, from Microsoft. Uh, Maxwell Research, uh, with uh, years, a year of experience and uh, test, uh, created this kind of processors and uh, put inside of HoloLens this kind of uh, engine. The last thing, but not so many important, is about the sound. Maybe you know the stereo sound, but in, in a, a word like uh, that, the left and right are totally surpassed. Because uh, if you receive a sound, I need to move the sounds from my hearts, from the source, and from myself. So there is not uh, the uh, stereo uh, idea, but the special sound is the idea that you receive from this uh, red uh, piece of the device, the sound where you move uh, in, the, in the physical environment. So I switch from my application just to use this tool so you can see, amazing, you can see what I do. I turn off my device, okay. Okay. Just a moment. Okay. Okay. So I need to move myself uh, really slow so you can see on the screen uh, what I do. I have uh, put in my head my device, 
Uh, the first thing is uh, to use my hands just to understand the physical env environment. So if I do this kind of uh, gesture, I ask to my device uh, to visualize uh, a sort of polygons to understand the, the, physical, uh, the physical world. In reality, this kind of operation is uh, ready. Uh, also, if I don't uh, ask to my device to understand the physical environment. This kind of gesture is just to uh, present to you this kind of uh, polygons. The second gesture is that. So I can ask to my device my Windows 10 menu, and I want to move my comments just to choose my first application for you. I start my application and I put on the wall. Um, okay, the idea... Okay, the idea is to uh, present to you uh, something special from uh, Hearts. So I uh, talk with the measure of Florence, you know I am Italian, uh, to uh, bring us uh, the David of uh, Michelangelo. Uh, it's a little bit difficult to uh, get for us the real uh, statue, so the measure send us uh, an uh, holographic version of the, of the David of Michelangelo. As you can see, uh, it's not the real uh, statue because uh, for uh, uh, attention, it's uh, inside of uh, that. If you can see, there is a piece inside of the chair, because I uh, understood that there is a physical layer, so this is a, a, a piece uh, on that. This is an example of Davide, David of Michelangelo that you can see in Florence. And in reality, you can see something special, because if you look here on the statue, you can see a detail that you can't see in Florence. Why? Because uh, the statue in reality is 5 meters and 17 centimeters, so it's not uh, the real size right now. But uh, you can interact, uh, uh, for example, with your voice in this way. Make bigger. Make bigger. My English. Make bigger. No. Make bigger. Effect demo. Okay. Uh, when you when you interact, uh, for example, with the statue, you can move in the original side, so five meter long, inside uh, in front of you. Uh, the idea is to uh, put uh, move on uh, in front of you. Uh, an example of uh, arts and culture, for example, from around the world. Uh, to create these uh, uh, holograms, uh, we have done a um, laser scan in Florence of the statue to create uh, a, virtual, um, a virtual model just to have <laughs> the, the statue in front of you. And you can... Okay. You can have... Uh, all kind of details of the statue, okay, in front of you. This is just a first, uh, first example, uh, just one example, but I want to present to you just another application. For example, you can walk inside of a city uh, just to stay here in Barcelona. For example, you know Seattle, the city of our headquarters, and you can put on your floor 
for example, here, I place um, an hologram on the floor just to see the Seattle city. This is Seattle, and I have a lot of details. I can interact, for example, in this way, just to have a zoom in or zoom out, just to see our, a city. And for, this is the library, uh, the National Library, uh, downtown Seattle. Or, for example, if you have an internet connection that don't have today, uh, you can ask, for example, uh, Rome or Madrid or uh, other, uh, other country just to create a virtual tour just to uh, before that you go in, uh, in a physical way. Uh, the interesting thing is that um, the city coming just from Bing. So there is not a software or program or otherwise. Yeah, you just uh, ask uh, a city and receive a map that comes from, uh, from Bing. Um, we have a lot of demo and scenario. Uh, we have an hour, me and you, if you want, just to try the, the holiness. I just want to uh, talk about three different uh, real scenarios, uh, really interesting uh, for me. The first is uh, uh, about the International Space uh, Station uh, around the world. Uh, inside of the station, we have uh, two devices, two HoloLens. So the astronauts receive from Cape Canaveral the programs, the program can put inside of the HoloLens, and the astronauts can try inside of the station the activities that they do uh, outside. For example, tomorrow we need to uh, take something uh, on the uh, Ebol uh, telescope. You can try inside, and we can share the same hologram with different devices. The second story is about the Volvo. If you want to buy a Volvo, you can, uh, okay, you can buy it here in Barcelona, but it's more interesting if you take a plane in Barcelona and go in Sweden. If you enter inside a showroom in Volvo, you can't find any physical car. No car inside. Wow. Uh, you can have just a HoloLens. You put your HoloLens on your head. You can interact with the HoloLens, with your voice. I want the model V90. Red, no blue, uh, no green, uh, with uh, tears, uh, or I change my uh, sport or accessories and so on. And why not? I can call my wife in Milan and say something like, okay, put your HoloLens on your head and look the same car. Okay. The third story is about Rolls Royce. Uh, Rolls Royce made beautiful car and also beautiful engine for uh, airplanes. Um, just five uh, months ago, for um, um, uh, study and um, uh, information from uh, the engineer team, uh, Rolls Royce had just two options. The first one was to put the engine from UK uh, to US. In US, 50 engineers just to study the engine, or the second option, uh, put 50 engineers come to UK uh, with the engine and study the, the, the engine. Right now, the engine stay in U UK, the engineers stay in US, and just send from another point of, the, of the world just an email with a program, and the engineers can put uh, the device on. Uh, they had and see the engine and study and uh, make activity just whatever you want. Thank you very much. This is Ololens and I stay here for you when you want.